Apple B.J. in her 1976 bestseller, Lyndon Johnson and the American Dream. The Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys was made into a 1990 miniseries. She won the Pulitzer Prize for No Ordinary Time, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and her memoir of growing up as a long-suffering Brooklyn Dodgers fan, Wait Till Next Year, was published in 1997. Her latest is Team of Rivals, the political genius of Abraham Lincoln. Doris Kearns Goodwin, live Sunday in depth, starting at noon Eastern on Book TV. And mark your calendars for Sunday, December 4th. Novelist John Updike will be the guest on Book TV's In Depth. A House panel this week looked into the problem of counterfeit prescription drugs. We'll hear from FDA officials, representatives of the drug industry, and consumers who have been affected by phony drugs. This is three and a half hours. Good afternoon and thank you all for being here. We are here because selling fake prescription drugs within the United States is a serious public threat and is a growing problem. This hearing will examine the vulnerabilities that allow counterfeit or substandard drugs to end up in legitimate pharmacies, how such vulnerabilities expose this nation to devastating terrorist attacks through our medicines, and the anticipated widespread counterfeit counterfeiting of life-saving avian flu treatment in the midst of a potential pandemic compounding the deadly toll of an outbreak. Just this morning, the President asked Congress for $1.2 billion for vaccines to prepare for an avian flu pandemic. We simply cannot risk vaccinating Americans with counterfeited therapies. This is a very serious issue to which we are calling our attention. According to the World Health Organization, 10 percent of global pharmaceutical commerce this year will be counterfeit. That number is expected to double by the year 2010 as international criminal organizations become more sophisticated. Last year within the United States, the FDA's counterfeit drug investigations rose 150 percent in only 12 months. One key to understanding this disturbing problem, I want to say phenomena, is the so-called gray market, which <clears throat> stems from the practice of drug diversion. Drug diversion is the principal method by which counterfeits consistently enter the legitimate drug market. The FDA confirmed with subcommittee staff that drug diversion was the entry point for every case investigated by that agency involving counterfeit drugs going into legitimate pharmacies. For example, closed door or own use pharmacies are primary sources for diversion. Own use pharmacies such as nursing homes or hospitals agree to provide medications solely to their own patients. Accordingly, such pharmacies acquire medication at a price much lower than wholesale. This opens the door to fraud, exemplified by some own use pharmacies overstating their patient populations, receiving surplus drugs, then selling them at a higher price into the gray market. Once drugs are on the gray market, they may be bought and sold dozens of times, passed among several hands, repackaged, mishandled, and relabeled. This happens easily because the pharmaceutical supply chain is not regulated by any single entity, private or governmental. The pharmacies within a state are monitored by state boards of pharmacy, which enforce the standards of care within each state. However, the state boards of pharmacy lack police power and many are limited to only a handful of inspectors. Drug manufacturers have to comply with the FDA for safety, effectiveness and labeling of their drugs. But drug manufacturers typically exercise no control over their drugs once they are shipped out of the manufacturing facility. Rather, the drugs are bought and sold by distributors and frequently pass in and out of the secondary market. Distributors, like retails, retailers and physicians, are licensed by the states, which must only meet the minimal standards set by the Prescription Drug Marketing Act. If you could display the first illustration. In order to obtain a distributor's license, some states' licensing standards provide an opportunity uh, for unscrupulous distributors to legitimately buy and sell pharmaceuticals. One of the most notorious recent counterfeit drug busts, the Carlo case, which we'll hear more about in our second panel, involved a convicted felon who obtained a state distributor license in Florida. As you can see on this map, 11 states, including Florida, have recently toughened their licensing standards for, distributor, for distributors. However, this leaves a patchwork of laws across the country, allowing for unscrupulous distributors to obtain legitimate state licenses and trade drugs in the secondary market. This situation of inconsistent standards throughout the country has prompted the Healthcare Distribution Management Association, or HDMA, to recently advocate uniform federal licensing standards for prescription drug distributors. 
Having a private business association advocate rigorous Federal licensing standards is something we rarely see. But it is clear that the gravity of this problem and the issues at stake have prompted the HDMA to take this radical step in order to promote the safety and security of our nation's drug supply. Nevertheless, the current system allows drugs to pass through several middlemen before reaching the patient's hands. When unscrupulous middlemen resell the drugs, they sometimes relabel them to reflect higher and more valuable doses, mishandle them to contaminate or degrade the drug, or substitute fake products for the legitimate goods. Uh, this is a photo of a legitimate tablet of Lipitor, a popular cholesterol-lowering drug a and a suspected counterfeit. They are virtually indistinguishable. The FDA recently indicted 11 individuals, a drug repacker, and two wholesale distributors in cases related to the sale of Lipitor. If you go to the third illustration, this is a close-up photo of Lipitor's registered trademark. The measurement in the upper left-hand corner shows the scale as 1 20th of a millimeter, which is incredibly small. While the microscopic examination can reveal the counterfeiting, the naked eye may not. With a vulnerable supply chain, counterfeit or substandard drugs like this counterfeit Lipitor can end up on the shelves of the trusted pharmacy and ultimately distributed to unsuspecting victims. For the patient, there is no commercial transaction like this. The patient has virtually zero ability to inspect the drug packaging or compare it to other samples. The patient who goes to a pharmacy to have his or her prescription filled is helpless in determining the quality of the drug and completely dependent on a system that has experienced some tragic breaches. Moreover, it is impossible to measure the scope of the problem and we cannot say with any degree of certainty how many or which counterfeit drugs make it to the pharmacy shelves because a health indication or ultimate death may be attributed to the patient's underlying illness rather than the drug. One way to verify a drug's authenticity is through a pedigree which would show the drug's chain of custody. Some of the states that have toughened their licensing standards for distributors, such as Florida, will soon require paper pedigrees for every drug purchased within that state. However, the FDA delayed until December 2006 the effective date for national regulations requiring a pedigree in the hopes an electronic track and trace program, such as radio frequency identification, or RFID, will be viable. The FDA has reported to the subcommittee staff that their Office of Criminal Investigations, or OCI, has turned out 71 indictments on their counterfeit drug cases, many of which involve multiple counts, leading to 67 convictions so far. Several more cases, not yet in the formal judicial process, are in the pipeline. Moreover, OCI's robust investigations have interdicted counterfeit drugs that would have otherwise made it to pharmacy shelves. However, significant vulnerabilities in the system still exist. In addition to providing a way for unscrupulous enterprises to obtain massive profits by distributing phony, high-priced drugs, the vulnerabilities in the system provide a way for terrorists to target our citizens. One frightening and widely discussed scenario among dozens of possibilities of how terrorists might exploit our vulnerabilities in this area involves a deliberate anthrax scare in order to trigger a run on Cipro, the antibiotic used for fighting the anthrax poison. A phony and deadly version of this medicine, having already been injected without detection to the nation's pharmaceutical stream by terrorists, would then cause thousands more deaths. Baz Muhammad, a Taliban-linked narco terrorist who was recently extradited from Afghanistan, defends a jihad of taking Americans' money at the same time the drugs we are paying for kill us. Finally, the counterfeit drugs issue is well illustrated by the immediate worldwide concern over an avian flu outbreak in the FDA's announcement last week that it anticipates an increase in the sale of counterfeit or fraudulent treatments for such a pandemic. Tamiflu, currently the only known treatment for this virus strain, is expected to be widely counterfeited. Counterfeit treatment in the midst of such a pandemic would most certainly compound the deadly toll of the flu. I do not want to wait until there are catastrophic failures in the system to examine the problems that allow counterfeit drugs into our pharmaceutical market. The time for examining and acting on this problem is now. Our first panel today is Mr. Randall Luter, Acting Associate Commissioner for Policy and Planning at the Food and Drug Administration. The second panel consists of Katherine Ebon, author of Dangerous Doses, and family members of two patients who are victims of counterfeit drugs purchased at mainstream pharmacies, Kevin Fagan, the father of Timothy Fagan, who received counterfeit epigen after his liver transplant operation, and Max Butler, the brother of Maxine Blount, who received counterfeit pro 
crit in the midst of her battle against breast cancer. The third panel consists of Mr. Peter Pitts from the Center for Medicines in the Public Interest, Carmen Catazone, Executive Director of the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, Jim Dahl, former Assistant Director of Investigations, FDA Office of Criminal Investigations, and Donald De Kiefer of De Kiefer and Horgan. Now I'd like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Elijah Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Counterfeit drugs represent a threat to the safety of the drug supply globally. The World Health Organization estimates that in poor countries, as much as 25 percent of the medicine consumed may be counterfeit or substandard. In some developing countries, the percentage is as high as 50 percent. In the United States, consumers can be confident that the safety and effectiveness of the drugs they obtain through the legitimate market are extremely safe and effective in relative terms. Nevertheless, there is ample evidence that counterfeit drugs are an increasing challenge for Federal and State regulatory bodies, pharmacies and drug manufacturers, and wholesalers. The health risk to consumers who obtain drugs that are fake diluted or mislabeled as to dosage, potency or other characteristics, char characteristics is potentially quite serious. Depending on the drug and the illness or condition the drug is being used to treat. Such drugs may be simply ineffective, resulting in a patient's condition going untreated, or they may very well be harmful. Charged with ensuring the safety and effectiveness of the drugs available, to consumers in the United States, the FDA is the lead federal agency for investigating U.S. counterfeit drug cases. Over the past several years, there has been a sharp increase in the number of counterfeit drug investigations undertaken by FDA's Office of Criminal Investigations. The number of these investigations range from 5 and 11 annually between 1997 and 2000. In 2004, FDA's OCI conducted 58 investigations, up from 30 the year before and 27 in 2002. This increase coincides with a similar increase in the amount of counterfeit drugs seized in the United States and in recent years. In 2000, an estimated 100,000 doses of counterfeit drugs were seized in the United States, whereas last year, an estimated 3 million fake medications were seized in our country. This suggests a substantial increase in the volume of counterfeit drugs available in the United States. Although most of the counterfeit drugs seized in the United States are destined for the black market or illegitimate Internet pharmacies, FDA investigations have also led to seizures of counterfeit drugs offered for sale in legitimate pharmacies. This raises serious concerns about the integrity of the supply chain between manufacturer and pharmacy. As we will hear today, the course a drug takes from the shipping dock to the pharmacy shelf can be convoluted, one and one that offers unscrupulous distributors numerous opportunities to exploit weaknesses in regulation and security. In 1987, Congress enacted the Prescription Drug Marketing Act to protect the American public from the emerging problem of counterfeit drugs. For a variety of reasons, 18 years later, some of the law's requirements have yet to be impl implemented by regulation. In July 2003, however, FDA formed a counterfeit drug task force to develop recommendation for that recommendations for addressing all aspects of drug counterfeiting. In February 2004, the task force issued a report entitled Combating Counterfeit Drugs, a report of the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA report highlights measures that can be taken to better protect Americans from counterfeit drugs, focusing on six areas, and they are securing the actual drug product and its packaging, securing the movement of the product as it travels through the United States drug distribution chain, enhancing regulatory oversight and enforcement, increasing penalties for counterfeiters, heightening vigilance and awareness of counterfeit drugs, 
and finally increasing international collaboration. Prominent among the proposed means for securing drugs through the supply chain is new technology designed to track and trace drugs as they travel in the stream of commerce from the manufacturer to the pharmacy. Adoption of drug authentication technology and stricter state licensing standards for drug distributors are other key measures recommended by the report. State regulators and industry also have taken notice of the counterfeit drug threat. For its part, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy has taken the important step of proposing new model rules for the licensing of wholesale distributors and, to date, 11 states have adopted the tougher standards. In addition, some major wholesalers and retailers have announced their intention to avoid obtaining drugs from secondary markets. Still, there is much to be done to ensure that efforts to protect the drug supply catch up to and keep pace with the actions of bad actors who think nothing of jeopardizing the health and safety of American consumers in order to turn a fraudulent profit. Today we will hear valuable testimony from the FDA, other industry stakeholders, outside observers, and representatives of victims of counterfeit drugs about the threat that fake, mishandled, or mislabeled products pose to the integrity of the United States drug supply and about what progress is being made to secure the United States drug supply against threats like diversion and illegal importation. And so, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this important hearing, and I look forward to the testimony. Mr. Burton, do you have any opening comments? No. Ms. Holm Norton, do you have any? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, because I do think this is, is a very important uh, uh, issue to focus upon. Frankly, I was surprised that there was no federal regulation uh, here. Uh, no one can doubt we are in interstate commerce this time, I think. Uh, and when we have the, um, the industry uh, saying that the hodgepodge of, uh, of state regulations and difficulty of enforcing at the state law means that we ought to have federal regulation, I'm, I'm about to listen. Uh, and I hope you are, Mr. Chairman, um, because it looks like this, is, this problem is growing way out of proportion and anybody can understand why. Uh, it, it seems to me it coincides uh, absolutely with the huge, the humongous increases in uh, pharmaceutical drug prices. Um, um, and the more you get of that, and that seems to be out of control, uh, even seniors, when uh, they get access in January uh, to our bill, will find that the prices continue to go up um, because there's nothing that that bill does about it. Uh, at least they're going to be in safe, I, be I believe, in the safe um, um, uh, HMOs or other organizations. Uh, but what could be more dangerous to the general population who do not have access to such a bill than fake uh, uh, pharmaceuticals? It is very, very um, uh, foreboding t to know about this uh, increase uh, when we know that people need many of these pharmaceuticals and will ha now have, because there is no federal regulation between um, the manufacturer and the pharmacy, uh, the, the temptation to, in fact, take advantage of what looks like a cheaper uh, version of the, of the drug. We are Americans. If you, know, if you can get it cheaper, if it's on sale, I mean, <laughs> I think that's why you have Walmart, uh, uh, then, then, of course, people are going to go for it. So I, I, I really pity the federal government that's trying to do this in the context of no real uh, strong federal legislation. And I hope that we are encouraged uh, to move uh, swiftly. When I think of the kind of medicines that my uh, constituents tell me about, uh, when I say to them, for example, you ought to use generics when you're using up, uh, uh, particularly if you're on 
Medicaid or Medicare because you are using up scarce dollars. And people then begin to tell me about differences in medicines that I don't, are not very familiar with, for example, high blood pressure medicine and how they try one or another until they get the right one. I can just imagine somebody uh, getting a cheaper high blood pressure medicine and thinking, well, this, I guess this is it. This is very, very dangerous. And of course, if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, the people who are most likely to look for cheaper drugs are going to be uh, middle class and poor people who just say, this is it. I just, if this is all I can get and if it costs half as much, I, I, I am going to do this. We already have blocked uh, reimportation. We could have reimportation legislation that controlled this, at least from outside of, of the United States, controlled how importation took, took place. You would think that at least within the United States uh, we could find a way to make sure that people aren't getting fake medicine. I think we ought to try to see what we can do about this before we go home this session. And I thank you again for this hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Ms. Smith from Ohio, our newest member of a subcommittee. Uh, and uh, welcome to the subcommittee. Do you have any opening comments you would like to make? Thank you very much. I ask, written, uh, ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record. Uh, objection, it is so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, documents and other materials referred to by members may be in included in the hearing record and that all members may be permitted to revise and extend their remarks without objection, it is so ordered. Our first panel is composed of Mr. Randall W. Luter, Lutter, Lutter, sorry about that earlier. Um, once I got it in my head, I couldn't get it out even though they corrected me, uh, who is the Acting Associate Commissioner for Policy and Planning at the Food and Drug Administration. As you know, as an oversight committee, it is our standard practice to ask witnesses to testify under oath. So if you will stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witness responded in the affirmative. Thank you for joining us today and we are looking forward to your testimony. Committee, I am Randall Lutter, Acting Associate Commissioner for Policy and Planning at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about FDA's efforts fighting counterfeit prescription drugs. Let me emphasize first that the overall quality of drug products that consumers purchase from U.S. pharmacies remains high. The American public can be confident that these medications are safe and effective. The FDA cannot, however, offer the same assurance about the safety and quality of drugs purchased from sources outside the U.S. regulatory system. Counterfeit drug makers operating outside the system seek profit by peddling fake medicines to sick patients who need real treatment, sometimes with tragic consequences. My testimony today will focus first on the growing counterfeit drug problem and then on FDA's efforts to secure and improve the safety of our drug supply. U.S. law defines counterfeit drugs as those sold under a product name without proper authorization where the product is knowingly and intentionally mislabeled in a way that suggests it is the authentic approved product. Counterfeit drugs include products without the active ingredient, with too little of the active ingredient with the wrong active ingredient or with fake packaging. This definition reflects fraud. Consumers wrongly believe they are buying a genuine product. Counterfeit prescription drugs are illegal and they are inherently unsafe. As you can see from the first slide, the number of newly initiated counterfeit drug cases has risen in the last few years. We believe the unusually high number of cases in fiscal year 2004 stems in part uh, to increased awareness and vigilance throughout the drug distribution chain as a result of FDA's 2004 counterfeit drug report. Increased referrals from other law enforcement agencies as well as improved communications with manufacturers. Fortunately, because of the expertise and extensive investigative experience of the Office of Criminal Investigations at FDA, we have been successful in stopping most of these drugs before they could reach consumers 
and we've also detected and dismantled many counterfeit schemes. Counterfeiters have become so sophisticated that many counterfeit drugs are virtually indistinguishable from genuine FDA-approved products. As shown in the second slide, fake Viagra appears superficially identical to the genuine product. As shown in slide three, fake Lipitor appears very much like the authentic product. As shown in slide four, even the packaging of fake serostim is cleverly made to look like the real thing. Counterfeit drugs can have serious adverse health consequences for patients. For example, a counterfeit Procrit, which is an injectable, sterile drug used by cancer and AIDS patients, contained not the active ingredient of Procrit, but non-sterile tap water, which could have caused a severe infection in the patients who received it. Second example is that counterfeiters tried to pass aspirin tablets as Zyprexa, a drug for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. This could have been dangerous for patients who are aspirin sensitive, who are aspirin allergic, or who have bleeding disorders. In addition, patients wouldn't receive their appropriate treatment for this potentially serious disorder. In 2001, in a report to Congress regarding the Prescription Drug Marketing Act of 1987, FDA noted that in order for secondary wholesalers to have full uh, pedigrees for their products, Congress would have to amend Section 503E of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. FDA issued final regulations implementing the Prescription Drug Marketing Act in 1999, but it stayed on several occasions certain provisions in response to public comments and to allow Congress to consider the 2001 report. The stay was most recently extended to December 2006 in the expectation that electronic trace, track and trace technologies would offer a low-cost alternative to paper pedigrees. In July 2003, FDA established an internal counterfeit drug task force to campaign against the growing threat of counterfeit drugs. The task force report released in February 2004 highlighted a multi-tiered approach to better protect Americans from counterfeit drugs. See slide five, please. The multi-tiered approach consisted of securing the actual drug product, securing its packaging, and securing its movement through the U.S. distribution chain, also enhancing regulatory oversight and enforcement, increasing penalties for counterfeiters, heightening vigilance and awareness of counterfeit drugs, and lastly, increasing international collaboration. For brevity, I focus here on new technologies that might help us secure more effectively the product, its packaging, and the movement through the supply chain. New technology that could electronically track and trace the movement of a drug product could pro provide a reliable electronic drug pedigree. Slide six shows the information that an electronic pedigree might accumulate as a product moves through the distribution system. Radio frequency identification, the most promising electronic track and trace technology, uses a tiny radio frequency chip, an example of which appears in slide seven. Adoption of RFID technology will allow supply chain stakeholders to track the chain of custody or the pedigree of every package of drugs through every step of the supply chain. Our other initiatives include encouraging health professionals to use the MedWatch form to report suspect counterfeit drugs to FDA. We've created a counterfeit alert network to provide timely and effective notification of verified counterfeit events to, their, uh, to members and constituents of a variety of groups. We're distributing public service announcements to consumers and collaborating with international partners. Before I conclude, I'd like to touch on an issue of recent interest for public health regulators and legislators. As public awareness grows that avian flu is a potential public health threat, FDA anticipates an increased risk of counterfeit or fraudulent treatments. Although the agency is not aware at this point of any counterfeit uh, Tamiflu cases in the United States, there are initiatives in place to deter counterfeiters and parties who would sell fraudulent or phony products against avian flu. In conclusion, despite recent progress, there remains a viable and concrete threat of counterfeit drugs entering distribution in the United States. We must all work together to pursue the measures identified in the FDA's counterfeit report to further protect U.S. patients against counterfeit and unsafe drugs. Thank you. 
You said in your uh, testimony that you asked Congress in uh, 2001 in the report to amend Section 503E to make a pedigree requirement universal. Are you maintaining that uh, that is a major reason you haven't gone ahead with the pedigree, or uh, I don't understand what the point of that is? Since the time that recommendation was offered, uh, there's been no legislative action. Our current proposal is to do the best we can given current law and the authorities that we have. So you're saying without a universal pedigree, there's, it's no point in having our, a pedigree? Our, our expectation is that um, the track and trace technology um, exemplified by RFID would offer a way to implement um, uh, an electronic pedigree um, uh, given the existing authorities. So you wouldn't need to do the amendment with the electronic? It would still be helpful and the recommendation still stands. It's unclear that um, while we have substantial optimism about the availability of uh, RFID um, by 2007, after the end of 2006, there's of course uncertainty about the schedule when it would be adopted. So uh, the criticism that the state, it, are you maintaining that the reason you haven't implemented uh, any kind of uh, pedigree is because of the failure to amend 503? The, the uh, decision behind the stay was in response to a variety of, of public comments, including from uh, members of Congress and the Small Business Administration, as well as from industry, that it would be uh, very difficult to comply with the regulation as drafted. They related in part to the uh, cost of uh, implementing the paper pedigree, which was the best available technology at the time, and also with respect to the difficulties of, of 503. This bill was passed 18 years ago. Uh, have the private companies done anything to I improve that, uh, to p establish a pedigree? What, what have they done to move ahead? Um, there are s some initiatives in some states where uh, states have already adopted uh, stringent regulations, Florida being, being one. A variety of uh, major pharmaceutical companies have taken uh, active steps recently to adopt voluntarily the RFID track and, and trace technology. We think that the um, actions by those uh, companies and also by Walmart, which as you know is a leader in retailing and in distribution, uh, provide a way for the industry to uh, move forward toward a lower cost electronic track and trace technology. Did uh, Florida move to an electronic track and trace or did they move to the paper trail that you said would be? They, oh. have, they have not adopted the electronic RFID. So they, they did in Florida what you said would be difficult for us to do at a federal level? Yes. And are other states copying the Florida example? Uh, there, have, there have been other examples also of other states. There are in a variety of uh, stages of implementation according to the states. FDA's policy in general has been to facilitate, to facilitate and support um, more stringent uh, uh, licensing requirements on wholesalers at a state by state level where um, uh, there have been uh, evidence that the existing requirements are, are lax. Well, why would you favor it on a state by state level but not nationally? Um, we at this point have no particular policy on the, the, the um, we're still studying the proposal by the HDMA which you alluded to in your earlier remarks. For 18 years? Yeah. Excuse me? For, for 18 years you've been uh, studying it. Uh, that. 1987, 1999 made more specific uh, questions. Part of the question is, is how, how long do you have to study something? Well, we issued the regulation uh, on the, the pedigrees in 1999, uh, uh, and we've stated it repeatedly since then. It did take a while to issue the regulation following the enactment of the law. And uh, are you going to continue to, to uh, just continue to stay this until you figure out whether the electronic will work or what's your? The, at the time that we issued the last day, we received ample public comment from the industry, from manufacturers, and from retailers that they believe that based on the available information that they had, that electronic track and trace would be feasible and widespread by the year 2007. Because electronic track and trace offered a lower cost way of satisfying pedigree requirements, 
we believed at that time that track and trace would be a way of satisfying the pedigree requirements after December 06. And that's why we issued, the, we extended the stay of the rule through December 2006. At this time, we continue to be optimistic that RFID would be economically feasible to the industry and available at that time, though of course there's uncertainty about how the technology will develop. Well, I did, I, that I, I've been more immersed in this last stretch here trying to figure out how we regulate pseudoephedrine with meth, and the arguments that you're making are, are, are so similar. As we try to deal with this at a federal level, uh, the administration's position has been, well, why don't we deal with this at a state by state level? So we have chaos uh, that people in one state go over to the next state uh, to get it, uh, that uh, then uh, we've been meeting about the difficulty of the paper trail um, and uh, whether it can be done electronically, which people hold out that may be a possibility to do this electronically. Now we're hearing that, in, in a sense, we have. The, everything somewhat in danger and we're going to hold out hope that electronic will do it. That's why my questions were, has anything been done in 18 years or is it, is it in fact the threat of a federal regulation? I mean, I, I have a family business. I mean, I grew up in family business and part of the question is at what point do you start to react either proactively to avoid the federal intervention or how long do we just wait and stay and stay and stay? And that's kind of what, where my questions uh, were driving. If, if you could tell us directly that the electronics will be implemented by date certain and that this in fact will work for small business. What we found in pseudo-federal is Target and Walmart can agree to these kind of things, but small business can't really function uh, that uh, because the bigger distributors will have electronic uh, ability, the smaller ones may not. So then you get into a situation of, of uh, we have electronics, but it, it automatically biases towards the big retailers unless you have a paper combined with it, which is what we're finding in the other areas. I, I just don't see how, uh, do you really think there'll be electronic availability in every little pharmacy and uh, grocery store in the United States in, what, what did you say, 2006? The information that was given to us from the industry a couple of years ago as we were preparing the, the counterfeit task force report and at the time that we developed the decision on this day was that there was substantial optimism. A lot of that was because the RFID is, is not primarily for uh, counterfeit um, control in the sense of providing a pedigree, but also it provides substantial business advantages to the, to the wholesalers and to the industry, the manufacturing companies, in, turn, in terms of giving them information about the management of their inventories to lower inventory control costs and to provide an opportunity for them to better manage the, the distribution of their entire product. The information that we had from them is that this would be economically feasible by the year 2007. Clearly, these expectations depend on their judgment about the development of a new technology. We will have to reassess the development of that new technology as we approach the expiration of the state late next year. In the meantime, you wouldn't do a paper technology. Why, why, why wouldn't you do what states are doing in, in meth precursors it, and other things is put a paper trail in and when the electronics come, you replace it with electronics. In, in 2001, when we originally issued the stay, there was substantial opposition from the industry, including the Small Business Administration, that this would put out of business many small secondary wholesalers. And since um, this is also in response to these, con uh, these concerns expressed by the industry and by the Small Business Administration and by members of Congress, we decided to implement the stays. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. <laughs> who are these counterfeiters? Do you know? I mean, do they have any idea who they are? The counterfeiters. Are they people in this country or outside of the country? I mean, what's. Well, the counterfeiters um, are identified primarily through the ongoing uh, criminal investigations in terms of who they are. When the products are sold in this country, where FDA has jurisdiction, they're sold by uh, uh, American typically American uh, uh, pharmaceutical product wholesalers, uh -huh. and the products are typically intercepted at that level, I or see. people who are masquerading in any event as such wholesalers. And they, they are, and you say in your testimony, I think you said that they, <clears throat> you, we catch them usually before they get to the retail point? We, we have been successful to date in, in, in catching most of the products before they reach retail distribution. And why is that? How has that come about? 
I, I think it's largely because of the quality of the tips and the information that we get from the manufacturers and from the uh, wholesale distribution um, uh, system. Most of the uh, uh, counterfeit um, investigations that we initiate are not the result of a, a consumer saying, I got a product which isn't genuine, because it's clearly extremely difficult for consumers to make the distinction. Instead, there's sometimes from uh, manufacturers who give tips that they've, a product has been brought to their attention, which is not one of theirs, but in fact resembles theirs, or it's from a, a wholesaler who also has information that products are being sold as if they were um, uh, uh, FDA approved when in fact they're products which um, are, uh, are, are not. And, and uh, it's that sort of information that uh, is usually the impetus for the investigations that we undertake. Just recently we had uh, on this national news this thing about the folks trying to sell some uh, fake flu vaccines. And how did that come about? How did that information come about? Uh, that was a case in Texas where the flu vaccine was uh, uh, injected at a workplace. Um, it's actually not a counterfeit product because apparently it was not sold as if it was a brand name vaccine. It was surely fake, it was fraudulent, it was unsafe, it was potentially dangerous. And unapproved, under unapproved? Unapproved, surely. Um, my understanding it was that the, vac the uh, um, syringes were filled with uh, sterile water. Mm -hmm. um, surely the people received no benefit in terms of protection against flu, which is uh, the primary interest that they were seeking the vaccinations. So you're say saying then that we are able to catch most of the, the, the people that we have been able to uh, at least catch, I guess. They have, we've gotten to them before they got the product to the retailer. And who are these retailers? Who, where, where are they? I mean, where, where are, is, is there any particular part of the country where you see this? more prevalent? I, I, I don't think it's um, easy to generalize about the, the, what types of retailers are more inclined to be buying this. I think uh, many um, retailers will, are business people and will, uh, are potentially vulnerable to uh, sales of, of, uh, of um, uh, counterfeit products when they're made available. So um, I think in that sense it's a potentially widespread uh, uh, problem. And how often do we find these uh, drugs uh, actually getting to retailers, I mean, from what you can see. Is that a major problem? I mean, I know, I know what you just said. Do we see a number of cases where they actually get to the retailer? Based on conversations with uh, the senior staff in the Office of uh, Criminal Investigations at FDA, I don't think I'm able to generalize about that. We just don't know. Now, there seems to be an increase in FDA counterfeiting investigations here re recently. How much is that attributed to heightened uh, vigilance or to the extent that the problem may be just getting worse or, I mean, do you have any idea? We've, we've had extensive discussions internally about exactly that question. Uh, the best professional judgment we have is that the problem is indeed getting worse. Um, there are probably more counterfeit drugs out now than there used to be. Notwithstanding that, we believe that the overwhelming majority of all products available in the United States are safe. The, as to why there is an increase, um, that's a very difficult uh, question. We believe that the increase in initiated new investiga investigations, the first chart that I presented today, that reflects largely two things. One is a, uh, is a growing uh, threat in terms of the number of counterfeits that may exist, and the second one is improved information that we get from manufacturers and from wholesalers, from the law enforcement community, both at a federal level and at a state and local level. And those better tips are ones that are, help us initiate more investigations than was the case in the past. And do we have, uh, do you all, do you feel that you have enough money to do the things that you need to do? Here we have an increase in the investigations and based on what you just said, uh, it seems as if people have uh, decided that this is a, a business that they want to be a part of, this counterfeiting business, that is. Do you feel that we have enough money? We're trying to concentrate on a number of issues, as you well know, uh, in our country. And I'm just wondering if you believe that your folks have enough money to do what you need to do. Because if this continues to increase, 
um, I can see a situation where a lot of people can be harmed, and I was just wondering. Let me, let me say first that the most recent available data on the number of inv investigations is somewhat reassuring. The very high number in fiscal year uh, 2004 of 58 fell the following year to 32. And that suggests that the um, very high number in that one year was uh, uh, somewhat unusual. The decline may be due in part to successful deterrence. It may be due in part to the fact that when we initiated new investigations, in the most recent year, we discovered that some of those, in fact, were linked to investigations initiated in the earlier their year and therefore were not independent. And when accounting for these investigations, uh, taking uh, um, in, in a manner that attempted to count merely the number of independent ones, uh, the independent investigations initiated in the last year was lower. With respect to your question of whether or not we need, we need more money, um, we have a variety of priorities at the FDA in the Office of, of, of uh, Regulatory Affairs and um, with respect to the uh, criminal investigations in particular. Um, the Office of Criminal Investigations is responsible for medical devices, also foods, as well as drugs. It also investigates uh, cases of fraud regarding uh, drug, new drug applications. Uh, given those competing priorities, we do the best we can with the resources that we have. Well, what does that mean, though? Mr. Chairman, I've got to finish this. Just, just give me one second. We are here uh, talking about the drug counterfeiting, and I need to know where that falls in all the things that you just stated. That's one question. The other question is to help me understand isn't it possible that we still may have a very significant problem in the mere fa case that the, the, the mere fact that there have been maybe, as you just testified, less investigations not, may not necessarily mean that there are less problems? I mean, is that, I mean, and then can you answer those two and then I'm, I'm finished? Well, there, there's a very tenuous relationship between the number of investigations and the extent of the problems. We believe that there's more problems associated with counterfeit drugs in recent years, call it the last two or three, than there were in, the, in, in, uh, in uh, five or six years ago. In that sense, the trend is, is, uh, is, is disturbing. Um, um, and, I'm sorry, and your other question? I was just trying to figure out exactly where in the line of priorities you just gave me, I asked the question, first of all, do you have enough money? Then you gave me a whole list, a laundry list, and rightfully so, of the things that are priorities for you. And I'm just trying to figure out where this falls in the list. Is there some, something that's at the top of the list? Is this at the bottom of the list? Where, where is it? I, I, the, um, the way the OCI is managed is that the investigators are generalists. They are assigned to different um, topics according to where the opportunities are and where the information lies that they can be most effective. And in that sense, I think the, um, the, it's very difficult to come up with a single ranking of where the priorities are because it depends on the particular circumstances available in any inv in particular investigations. Thank you. I understand your testimony to say that the FBI, FDA, uh, that you systematically random test drugs at pharmacies and grocery stores that you systematically random test things on the internet or at, uh, say, flea markets or uh, other selling points uh, to see if there's fraud? No. Then how in the world can you say under oath that you know what the level of the problem is? In other words, all you can testify to us is how many... I, 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 I'm questioning how he can testify under oath that he knows the extent of the problem if you're not doing any testing other than from a tip. Um, Mr. Chairman, I mentioned earlier that it was based on the, the best professional judgment of the, of the um, in other words, tips. staff in the, in the Office of Criminal Investigations that the trend is increasing and that the problem of counterfeit. But you said earlier that, that uh, you believe it's generally been an increasing trend, but you have made statements that the bulk, that it's, that uh, I was responding really to Mr. Cummings' first question. You downplayed, you said, uh, the overwhelming numbers and all this kind of stuff. The fact is you don't know. Based on the tips, which is one indicator, but you, if you're not doing random testing, 
particularly we, in high we, risk areas, you don't know. We, we, we do lack this all the time in other kinds of narcotics. We, you can't we, make that statement because you don't have a border check uh, that's systematically doing it, or do you? That's what I'm asking. Are you, are you basing this solely on how many criminal investigations are initiated from tips? We lack the resources to conduct the sort of randomized testing of products sold in, in the market that I think you're describing. We have not contemplated that. We've never done it. And My is understanding a, is it. That is a very fair statement, and we may all have to decide that the return risk isn't there. But then we can't make sweeping statements about safety if we haven't random tested. The, the, the statement about safety is, best, is based on the on many years of experience of the FDA professional staff who are responsible for ensuring the safety of, of and effectiveness of drugs sold in America. And their collective judgment is that the vast majority of these products are safe. Thank you. Mr. Burton. We're all against counterfeit drugs. You probably don't know this, but we had Mr. Hubbard before my committee when I was chairman of the full committee about five times. And we were talking about the reimportation of pharmaceutical products. And he said that they couldn't guarantee the safety of them. And I asked him how many people died from aspirin or Tylenol last year. And he didn't know. I said, do you have any records about that? And he says, well, no. And I said, how many people were injured last year from pharmaceutical products uh, imported from Canada, where they have a pretty rigid pharmaceutical policing system? And he says he didn't know. And I've got all the testimony here from two or three hearings. If you would like, I'd be glad to give you all of that. The fact is, you don't know. You just don't know. And policing it is very, very difficult. The reason that people import pharmaceutical products is because the cost disparity is so great. The pharmaceutical industry charges 8, 9, 10, 20 times more in the United States for the very same product that's sold in Germany, France, England, Canada, and elsewhere. And you've got people who on fixed incomes who have to split their pills. You talk about being safe. They split their pills, split their medication because they can't afford to buy the pills because they cost so much here where they could go across the border in Canada and get the same thing, 10 times as many pills for the same price. That's the problem. And we never heard about this kind of a problem before we started talking about reimportation. The counterfeits. I never heard. We, we had hearings for four years. We never talked about counterfeit drugs until we started talking about reimportation. And then all of a sudden, the pharmaceutical industry and the FDA and HHS started saying, oh my gosh, we've got a terrible problem with counterfeit drugs and it's going to really create a terrible problem for the American people. Never heard about it till then because of the profit margins that we were talking about. I'm a free enterprise advocate. I believe in the companies making a big profit. I want them to. But I don't want Americans to pay 10 times for ta Taxol. My wife died of cancer a few years ago. I don't want Americans paying 10 times for Taxol what they do in Canada or France or Germany or someplace else. And hiding behind this counterfeit thing really bothers me. We're against counterfeit drugs. We want the purity to be there. But to keep saying, you know, oh my gosh, we can't have reimportation. We can't have import drugs from Canada and, 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 and France and Germany because of that is, is just an argument that's being fostered by those who want to make a lot more money here in the United States and saddle the profits on the back of the Americans while the rest of the world gets off scot-free. You can give me all this stuff you want to about the FDA being concerned. Uh, that really bothers me. Now I want to talk to you just a little bit about the wholesalers. And I'm disappointed that we don't have any wholesalers here today to, uh, on the panel. And I don't blame the staff or the chairman for that. I just think that I wish they were here so they could defend themselves when you talk about the problems that they face. Can you detail for us any significant counterfeit drug cases that have arisen since late 2003? I'm not prepared to do that. Give me one. Okay, you can't. When the Health Distributor Management Association published their recommended guidelines for pharmaceutical wholesaler operation that tracked counterfeit or stolen product, specifically back through licensed secondary market wholesalers, that was in 2003. I don't think FDA can give us any counterfeit evidence since then. And I'm not so sure you can go back even further than that. Okay, what's been done by the industry, the wholesale industry, particularly wholesalers in reaction to the counterfeit problems that we've heard about? Can you give us an, any idea what they've done to protect the, the buying public? 
I'm, I'm sorry, what's been done by the wholesale what industry? What has been done by the wholesale industry, particularly wholesalers, in reaction to the counterfeit problems that you've been talking about? Um, I, I think one might, uh, sir, ask that question of the wholesale industry. Well, you guys are at the FDA, and you've been talking to the wholesale industry about the problems that's been created by these counterfeit drugs going through the process. Have you talked to anybody in the wholesale industry about what they've done? We have talked to them about their... Okay, what have they done? They came to present to us recently their proposal with respect to uniform national licensing standards. Have you heard of the Health Distributors Management Association, HDMA? Yes, sir. Okay, what have they done to help protect the buying public from the wholesale products that are, products are going through their wholesale operation? You don't know? I'm not prepared to answer that, sir. Yeah. Well, why is it fair to cast a blanket across the entire secondary market when, in fact, many are legitimate businesses providing a valuable service and you don't have any answer for me today? You know, I can see I'm out of time, but I just want to say, obviously, we want to protect the buying public from counterfeit drugs because they're not safe in many cases. But at the same time, there's a responsibility on the part of the pharmaceutical industry in this country to make sure that Americans buy a product at a fair price that we don't saddle the American people with a product like Taxol, then they have to pay eight or ten times as much as they do right across the border in Canada. That's the reason why people import. And with the Internet being the way it is today, you have a Herculean problem. Because if you stop the importation of products from Canada, they'll get on the Internet and buy it from Germany. And if you stop it from Germany, they'll get on the Internet and buy it from France. Or they'll buy it from Spain. And it's very difficult for you to regulate everything that's going through the U.S. mail. And you're talking about little old ladies and little old men who can't afford to buy this product because it's so much more expensive here than abroad. And so you've got a really a Herculean problem in controlling this. And I want you to control it because we don't want counterfeit products in the marketplace. But we want to make sure that Americans don't pay an exorbitant price for the same life-saving drugs that right across the Canadian border are costing a Canadian woman with breast cancer one-tenth of what it costs here in the United States. Ms. Norton. Uh, thank you very much, and I think the gentleman has a point. Um, uh, Dr. Lutter, um, it, this subcommittee has, has had a lot of hearings, and one of the things, one of our major frustrations is with the problems law enforcement have in getting control of any valuable substance. Uh, in many of our hearings, are, of course, are about drugs which are very valuable to addicts and to people who sell to them. So I was, I was taken aback by your uh, statement on page two. Most of the counterfeit drugs at issue did not reach consumers. How do you know that most counterfeit drugs do not reach consumers? This statement is intended to apply to the counterfeit drugs found during the course of the investigations. So with respect to in other counterfeit drugs, we just don't know in that sense, well, I mean, yes. That's like saying, you know, the drugs we confiscate, the heroin we confiscate does not reach the streets of New York and D.C. So, I mean, you, you really have got to watch out for these blanket statements. Sure, anything that you are investigating, if it turns out to be legitimate, it might not reach it for that matter. But that is, that, this is an unqualified statement. Most of the counterfeit drugs at issue do not reach consumers. The, the counterfeit drugs that we find in the course of our investigations as a well, generalization don't reach well, consumers. I'm trying to cl clarify that here. I, I very much appreciate the, the clarification. Um, uh, because later on in your testimony, uh, you, you talk about how, uh, where, where, how um, cleverly, uh, in fact, in your oral testimony right after you uh, indicated that you were catching everything, um, you then went on to show us a set of slides about just how cleverly these drugs are packaged so that you'd have to have a trained eye to even know they were counterfeit. So I take it that um, there may be many consumers out here 
without an FDA's trained sense of what's counterfeit and what is not, since even your people have to look closely at it, who may be passing these counterfeit drugs off? Would that be a true statement? It, it is absolutely true that there may be some um, first of all, it's very difficult for people to distinguish these uh, counterfeit drugs from the genuine. That was the key point of the, of the slides that I tried to show earlier. With respect to the comment about whether or not uh, consumers may be exposed to counterfeit drugs, absolutely. Our system is not foolproof. We do the best we can with the no, resources. No, because you're only law enforcement folks. And, and no, I mean, no prosecutor will tell you that he catches all the criminals. <laughs> You know, he catches a tiny number and then he hopes that has an effect on the rest who might be inclined toward criminality. Uh, uh, I understand that about 50 percent uh, of the drugs on sale in some countries uh, are counterfeit. What percentage of the drugs on sale in this country would you, uh, would you uh, believe are counterfeit? Because surely you can interpolate once you know how much you have. You're a PhD. You know then how to calculate how many uh, go on sale that may be counterfeit, or at least are offered for sale that may be counterfeit. What would be your estimate? Let me begin by saying we don't have a scientific basis for coming up with an accurate estimate. Do you of have any that. statisticians in your department? We do we, have statisticians. You could certainly. Uh, do you agree? You have a PhD that you could extrapolate. Uh, once you know how many you catch and then try, try to at least estimate, even if you truthfully said, of course, as you must, this is only an estimation of how many counterfeit drugs uh, are out there? Our best estimate is that it's significantly less than 1 percent. And you have that on, you just now told me you couldn't, and now you tell me that less than 1 percent in the United States are counterfeit. Significantly less than 1 percent. How do you know that, sir? That's based only on the professional judgment of the staff at FDA. But not based on the kind of extrapolation that I have asked for, the statistical extrapolation. It is, it is not based on a statistical calculation such you know, as let, the, let me tell you something, Dr. Lett. To the extent that you are truthful with people by saying these things are out here, we have only our own uh, uh, you know, professional judgment, but they're out here in larger and larger numbers. To the extent that you say that, you make people more and more leery about about purchasing drugs that may be counterfeits. I don't find it very helpful uh, that uh, you are operating uh, without uh, uh, that, you're, that the that the FDA is operating without doing the necessary uh, statistical work so as to warn consumers of the statistical probability of, in fact, having counterfeit drugs to reach them. Wouldn't that help people to be, including pharmacists and others, to help you in the law enforcement challenge you reach? Undertaking that sort of statistical analysis is something that we haven't previously contemplated. It would take significantly more resources than have been available to date. Oh my God, I'm sure I could. I, well, come on. I don't. Come on. I'll put you in touch with some PhD math students in statistics who can help you out, Dr. Lutter. I do not think that this is a complicated statistical problem. And, Mr. Chairman, I ask that uh, the agency be. Uh, be uh, uh, requested uh, using its existing resources uh, to try to find out what the statistical probability is. I really don't believe that that is a, uh, that that, that is a complicated problem. And I do believe the at the very least the public, if it knew that, might be um, more inclined to, to, to be uh, careful. Um, uh, doctor, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ludwig, one more question. You, you say at page four, in order for sec secondary wholesalers to fully comply with pedigree requirements, by which we mean understanding throughout the chain uh, whether l drugs are uh, legitimate, you, Congress would have to amend section 503E, and you say later in questions that you're just doing the best you can, and you indicated what some of the problems were when questioned. Uh, uh, it, does the agency recommend that we, in, in fact, amend 503E? 
That was a recommendation we issued in 2001, and we still stand by it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Smith, do you have any questions? Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was listening very closely to the questions that my colleague was asking and the response, and it occurs to me that maybe this hearing is premature because, um, and my good friend Dan Burton has the same concern I have, and um, you know, a lot of it goes to the price of manufacturing, and of course there should be concern about these fake drugs, but I'd like to know the magnitude of the problem. Now, I tell you what I'm more concerned about, and you can respond if uh, you've heard these rumors, that there seems to be a consistent rumor that uh, terrorist organizations are planning to uh, spike up drugs and things, and that's one way of killing off Americans. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to hold a hearing maybe on that kind of threat to us because uh, they're getting very clever in the way they plan to attack us. But I think to make the kind of assertion that we've got uh, these counterfeit drugs running rampant and we need to be cautious, we need to base it on a little more statistical data than I'm hearing. Of course, I came in late. I don't know how much transpired before I came in, but hearing on counterfeit drugs within the United States takes for me more statistical evidence that there is a real serious problem with the counterfeit drugs. That's the excuse you use for uh, being opposed to reimportation. And what I would like to do is, this goes to the chair and our committee, is to really look into the rumors that I'm hearing because the addiction level in the United States of America, because of the marketing of drugs the way we do, uh, could be the beginning of something that could have an impact on our society. We're talking about homeland security. Well. We better start looking at these rumors. So uh, I just want to say that I'd like to kind of back up what Eleanor Holmes Norton was saying, that we really need more evidence that this is a problem that should take priority right now. I think the threat to us, uh, as rumored, is more of a priority. So uh, thank you for the time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gutnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Dr. Lutter, I, I don't know if we've met before, uh, but I have been involved and in, interested in this issue uh, for a long time. Uh, and since you couldn't uh, answer the question of Mr. Norton, uh, uh, Mrs. Norton, I, I, let me answer at least. According to the uh, FDA's open counterfeit uh, drug cases uh, report, or the report done by the Task Force on Importation, uh, in 1997 there were six cases. Uh, in 98, there were four cases. In 99, there were six cases, Representative Norton. Uh, in 2001, there were 20 cases. In, two, in 2002, there were 22 cases. And uh, the last year, we have numbers for 22. Just out of curiosity, do you know how many people died in hospitals last year of getting the wrong drug? Uh, there are estimates by the Institute of Medicine a few years back that uh, up to uh, high tens of thousands of uh, deaths per year are attributed to medication errors. It, 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 it generally is over 5,000 a year. And here we're talking about 22 cases. Now, the other thing I, I just want to call your attention to, and we have been trying to get the FDA uh, to get involved in, 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 in anti-counterfeiting uh, packaging for at least four years. And I remember the first time we had a meeting on this with one of the directors who's no longer with FDA. Uh, and we talked about this. He said, well, this can't be done. And then I reached in my pocket and I showed him a $20 bill. And I said, well, you know, the United States Treasury now has come up with a pretty good anti-counterfeiting technology for our $20 bills. Well, he said, that can't be done in drugs. And I thought, that's kind of an interesting attitude. But that technology exists today. 
It is being used in Europe. At least five of the major pharmaceutical companies are using it. This is a problem. I mean, counterfeiting is a problem. But it just strikes me that the FDA is not really serious about that, because if they were, they would be focusing on, on really helping us solve the problem. There is also a technology, and I don't know if it has been talked about here in this hearing yet today, uh, using these little computer chips. And frankly, I don't know if my staff stuck them in here. But uh, we can show them to you. And we have brought the cost down now to about 10 cents per chip. And they are incredibly amazing little chips. You can literally tell where the drug was made, the day that it came off the line, uh, simply through a relatively simple reader. Now, the drug companies themselves are interested in this because they have a keen interest. I would have a question, though. In the, in the studies that you have done in counterfeit drug cases, have most, is most of the counterfeiting being done in the United States or is it coming in from other countries? The uh, products themselves are often manufactured overseas and smuggled into the no, United States. No, no, no. States I didn't say often. Here. No, no, no. Where is most of the counterfeiting actually being done for the drugs being sold in the United States? You mean the manufacturing of the products or their, or their distribution for sale? Where are they actually making these counterfeit drugs? There because are the studies that I've seen, most of them are actually made here in the United States. The, the information that we have from the Office of Criminal Investigation suggests that the manufacturing itself is often overseas. I'm sorry, that, that, that doesn't square with what we've been told. And, and the real issue, and, and this is where the FDA continues to miss the point, people don't counterfeit $1 bills, do they? They counterfeit $20 bills, but mostly they counterfeit $100 bills. The reason that the, there is an industry developing both illegal importation and counterfeiting is because we have done nothing to help level the prices that Americans pay for prescription drugs. And that's the real issue here that nobody wants to talk about. And that's why more and more people say, you know, I can make more money in, in getting into the business of selling uh, Celebrex or Tamoxifen, which it used to sell for about $500 in the United States. This is one of the examples, Mr. Chairman. It used to sell for about $500 a month in the United States. You could buy it in Canada for less than $100 a month. You could buy it in almost every European country for less than $100 a month. The reason that people are starting to look at doing these kinds of things is because we have done nothing to help level the prices that Americans have to pay for these drugs. And so it seems to me that if the FDA ever wants to get serious about addressing these kinds of issues, you ought to go to where the big problems are. And the big problem is that Americans are being held hostage. They pay way too much for their prescription drugs. They know it and everybody else knows it. And yet the FDA says, well, we have to go after these 22 cases. Right? 22 cases when thousands of people are dying every year from prescriptions given in hospitals. And the FDA is doing nothing about that. I mean, there's, there's no plan to deal with that. And yet we could use barcoding technology. We could use all kinds of things that are available today uh, to change those numbers. So uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm a little, uh, I get a little, uh, uh, I get a little emotional about this because we have been in this battle now for four years and for four years the FDA has said, you know what, we want to work with you. And for four years there has been absolutely no help whatsoever. And I am sorry that you are the one that is uh, on the hot seat today and I happen to be in this seat today, but uh, we are not going to give up on this. And trying to scare people because you have 22 cases of, of, uh, of uh, counterfeit drug cases when we have literally <laughs> millions of other problems dealing with, with prescription drugs. Let me just add one last point, Mr. Chairman. I know my time has expired. But the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration. Do you know what percentage of the, of the food coming in, the, the fruits and vegetables coming into the United States are contaminated with foodborne pathogens, including things that can kill you? Do you know what percentage it is? I'm not the, I'm the answer is the FDA has actually got a report on that. It is roughly 2 percent. Now, that is a much higher percentage then the numbers, and, and, and with all due respect, your, your, your guess I think was, is way high in terms of the counterfeit drug problem. But I think we have a lot bigger problems and, and, and they are largely, the problems with drugs today are, are all centered around one fact, and that, Amer that is Americans pay way too much for what they, what they get. And we are doing almost nothing to stop importing fruits and vegetables, even though we, we know by our own studies. 2 percent of the fruits and vegetables coming into the United States are contaminated with foodborne pathogens that can kill you. I yield back my time. Uh, before moving to our second panel, I want to clarify that you have informed the committee, the OCI did, that there are 58 cases in 2004, not 22, and that is 
jump. Is that correct? 58 cases in 2004. Yes. Mr. Chairman, there were 22 cases in 2003. Yeah, and it jumped to 58 in 2000. But it wasn't 10,000. Yeah, and that when you have a case, is that 58 people who got one pill or are these uh, cases that could in fact affect thousands of people in each case? Sir, these are independent criminal investigations. So in that sense, yes, they vary in terms of their scope. Some may be very small, others may be quite large and potentially infecting large numbers of people, including thousands. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. If members have additional questions, we'll send to the, you those in writing. Thank, thank you, you for participating. The second panel could come forward. Before I swear the second panel in, we've been joined today by Congressman uh, Israel from New York, and he has would like to introduce one of the witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, express my appreciation for the courtesy uh, that you and the ranking member have extended in allowing me to sit in on this subcommittee, although I'm not a member, and allowing me to uh, introduce uh, one of my constituents, Kevin Fagan, uh, who will be sharing his family's story with you today. Uh, Kevin Fagan is a longtime resident of Deer Park, New York. He works as a second line supervisor at Con Edison, a company that he has proudly served for 22 years. He's married to Jean and the fa is the father of three children, Timothy, Lauren, and Caitlin. I first met Mr. Fagan in 2003 when he informed me that his oldest child, Tim, had been injecting himself with counterfeit epigen, a drug he picked up from a national pharmacy to help him recover from a liver transplant, a drug that somehow found its way to the Playpen South Strip Club in Miami uh, where it had been tampered with. This ordeal changed Mr. Fagan into a public advocate, determined to do what he could to ensure that more families don't suffer from loved ones receiving counterfeit medicines. He's dedicated himself to teaching elected officials and the public about the dangers of our prescription drug supply chain. Uh, since prescription drugs can change hands up to a dozen times between the manufacturer and the pharmacy, uh, these drugs, as we've learned today, can be tainted, diluted, relabeled, and counterfeited. As a result of my association with the Fagans, I've introduced Tim Fagan's law, H.R. 2345, which gives the FDA the authority to recall drugs, implements harsher penalties for criminals who counterfeit drugs, and requires pedigrees of a drug's origin. Kevin Fagan has been a remarkable champion of this legislation named in his son's honor, an outspoken advocate for the need to clean up our nation's drug supply. I'm pleased to introduce him as he shares his story and to again thank the chairman and the ranking uh, member for holding this vitally important hearing. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, this panel consists of Catherine Ebon, author of Dangerous Doses, uh, Mr. Fagan, who you've just heard uh, described by his uh, congressman, and Max Butler, brother of Maxine Blount, counterfeit drug victim. So if you'll each stand uh, as the uh, guidelines of this uh, committee, as an oversight committee, to swear each of your witnesses in. Do you swear the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We thank you for being here today, and we're going to start with Catherine. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for having me here. You need to tap your mic. Uh, th there should be a button. The light will come on, I believe. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Catherine Eben. Thank you for having me here. As an investigative journalist and book author, I spent the last three years documenting a rising tide of counterfeit medicine in our pharmacies and hospitals. My book, Dangerous Doses, How Counterfeiters Are Contaminating America's Drug Supply, was published this May. It is based on more than 160 interviews, over 13,000 pages of documents, and several years of firsthand reporting. Adulterated medicine routinely lands on our pharmacy shelves, in part because major wholesalers seek out discounted medicine from smaller ones. This extremely dangerous trading has degraded our medicine and endangered patients. A few numbers, 97,000 vials of counterfeit epigen and Procrit, enough to treat 30,000 cancer patients for a month, are believed to have entered the supply chain and reached patients in 2003, excuse me, in 2002, in 2003, 600,000 patients may have received counterfeit Lipitor, according to Pfizer's own estimate. One percent of the nation's drug supply is 35 million prescriptions. The FDA estimates less than one percent of the nation's drug supply is counterfeit. Some states uh, and other players have made significant efforts to restrict the flow of counterfeit medicine. 
Yet recently, 1,000 ExxonMobil employees in Texas were injected with counterfeit flu vaccine. In our poorest supply chain, medicine may move through a dozen hands on its way to the pharmacy. The wholesalers who buy and sell it may be narcotics traffickers, mafia members, or high-level diverters, some with legitimate state licenses. Though wholesalers in name, many never buy directly from manufacturers or sell directly to pharmacies. They are traders who buy and sell to one another in an all-hours auction. Every single counterfeit to reach American patients has moved through their hands with scant proof of its origin. Who in their right mind would buy this medicine? Everyone, unfortunately. Even the nation's major wholesalers set up trading divisions to scout for bargains from these middlemen, purchases that allow substandard and even counterfeit medicine to reach patients. Among recent reforms, major wholesalers, Cardinal Health and Amerisource Bergen, announced they would limit or cease their pharmaceutical purchases from secondary wholesalers, but gaping holes remain. Because our distribution system is national and medicine that is in California one day winds up in New York the next, our drug supply is only as clean as its dirtiest link. Tim Fagan, a 16-year-old liver transplant patient, learned this the hard way when life-saving epigen from his CVS pharmacy proved counterfeit. His medicine required constant refrigeration and stable handling, yet it was uplabeled by a counterfeiter, transported in used paint cans, and allegedly stored in the beer cooler of a Miami strip club. Its journey took me several years to reconstruct. If we could please show the slide. Thank you. Uh, his medicine began as low dose, or 2,000 UML epigen. Cardinal Health and Amerisource Bergen near the top sold 110,000 vials of it to a small Miami pharmacy which never dispensed it to a single patient, but instead sold it all to an accomplice of an alleged counterfeiter, Jose Grillo. Grillo packed the low-dose medicine into paint cans and carried them to a South Miami trailer, where a friend soaked the vials overnight, rubbed off the low-dose labels, and glued on fake high-dose ones for 40,000 UML. Grillo, awaiting trial, allegedly transformed each $25 vial into a $470 vial, a scheme worth $46 million. Investigators were only able to recover 13,000 of his vials, which means that 97,000 remained in the supply chain uh, and is presumed to have reached patients. Once he had uplabeled the vials, Grillo allegedly brought them to his customers, including the Miami Strip Club, where investigators believe he sold the medicine for one-sixth the average wholesale cost. The medicine then moved through a network of shell companies as represented by the dark gray in the middle of the chart, each one raising the price. An Arizona wholesaler, which ultimately bought the medicine, then offered Amerisource Bergen a deal, high-dose epigen for a price lower than the manufacturers. Amerisource bought back the very low-dose epigen it had originally sold, counterfeited in the interim. Despite recent reforms, Numerous diverters with wholesale licenses still peddle substandard medicine to all those seeking a discount and willing to take the risk. Consumers need to know where their medicine has been. The most important reform would be comprehensive pedigree records um, for every drug. Those who say impossible are likely committed to a Byzantine and opaque drug supply. Only federal regulations that mandate pedigree records will shed light on and eliminate the hidden paths that our medicine may take. I urge the committee to look at Tim Fagan's law introduced by Representative Steve Israel of Long Island, which requires paper pedigree records, strict regulation of wholesalers, severe criminal penalties for counterfeiting, and stronger enforcement powers for the FDA's Office of Criminal Investigation. Thank you for your commitment to protecting America's drug supply. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Fagan. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Fagan. And in 2002, my son Timothy received counterfeit epigen after a life-saving liver transplant. While I am thankful for your time today, I wish I had never heard of this topic. Um, Tim was very sick for a long time. And our trek to find a cause and a cure for his disease took us as far as the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. No answers could be found. Uh, Upon returning back from the Mayo Clinic, Tim's health took a severe turn for the worse, and he required a liver transplant. After surviving a nine-hour operation and a hospital stay, Tim returned home to further recuperate. 
our family thought our prayers had been answered when my son came home. Shortly after returning home, Tim became severely anemic, and his transplant team prescribed epigen, which is a leading anti-anemia injectable drug uh, to combat his anemic condition and bolster his already weakened uh, health. We received the epigen from a nationally known pharmacy, brick and mortar pharmacy. There was nothing over the internet. And uh, upon receiving the epigen injections once a week, several hours after each injection, my son woke up screaming in pain. Through everything my son has been through, I have never heard him scream like this before. Several hours after the first injection, the pain uh, caused him to wake out of a sound sleep. My wife and I ran into his bedroom. I fully anticipated finding a robber or a burglar from his blood-curdling screams. I had never heard him scream like this before in my life. We found his whole body racked in pain. Tim was doubled over, crying, screaming, help me. And I didn't know what to do to help my son. Uh, we immediately called his doctors. They were dumbfounded by the reaction, having never seen anything like this to this drug that they've prescribed to numerous uh, patients. And this same episode proceeded for eight more weeks. Finally, my wife received a call from our local pharmacy informing her that the FDA notified them that counterfeit epigen was on the market and to check the vials in our possession. My wife checked the vials and found that they were indeed counterfeit based upon the information supplied to her. They were missing a degree symbol and they had a certain lot number. We were understandably frantic with worry as to what this might have done to my son in the short term and the long term. Uh, I asked the pharmacy, how did this happen? They said, we get all our drugs, all our epigen, exclusively from Amerisource Bergen. I had never heard of Amerisource Bergen before. I looked up their number. I, uh, I called them in Pennsylvania and asked them how it happened. They, uh, they rushed me off the phone, to say the least and ended the call saying it's not their problem. As it turns out, it is their problem. Amerisource Bergen is the number 22 company on the Fortune 500 list. Amerisource Bergen is one of the three largest drug distributors in the United States. Amerisource Bergen has revenues approaching $50 billion a year. Yet instead of purchasing drugs directly from the manufacturer, they chose to purchase these drugs from the secondary or gray market where elected officials and law enforcement uh, agencies have identified as the source of counterfeit drugs into the supply chain. This was a domestic issue. There was no in, uh, international trading of drugs. This started in Florida, went through several uh, hands throughout the country, and wound up in my son on Long Island. Um, fortunately for us, uh, we have a congressman who is very much like you, interested in protecting their, their constituents, the regular people. And I contacted uh, Representative Israel for help. And his law, H.R. 2345, Tim Fagan's law, calls for tougher criminal penalties for those engaging or distributing counterfeit drugs. It calls for increased funding for the FDA to perform the very inspections that, that the committee called on earlier today at random. It calls for increased funding for law enforcement investigations. It calls for public education and track and trace technology. And I ask each and every one of you if you would please co-sponsor this legislation, which will protect all the Tim Fagans, potentially every American citizen, uh, from counterfeit drugs. Um, I thank you for your time. And again, I ask you to co-sponsor. I plead with you to please co-sponsor this legislation and make it a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming today, Mr. Butler. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. You need to put your mic on. Now? Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Max Butler, uh, brother of the late Maxine Blunt of Harvester, Missouri, a victim of counterfeit drugs. I'm honored that the committee has provided me with the opportunity to testify. I hope to illustrate the impact that this crime has had on our family and friends. This crime undermines the trust that society has in its doctors and pharmacies. It targets victims that are already fighting for their lives and one that often results in suffering and sometimes in early death. 
1998, Maxine Blount was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her doctor explained that her cancer was very serious and promised to provide Maxine with every opportunity to beat the cancer. Treatments began. She received chemo and radiation treatments to reduce the size of the tumors in her breast so that the doctors could safely do a mastectomy. After the mastectomy, Maxine continued to receive regular treatments until she began to take the counterfeit Procreate. The counterfeit Procreate made it impossible for her to rebuild her strength between chemo treatments. At the time that Maxine was diagnosed, she owned and operated a mailboxes, etc., a business that she loved and worked long hours at. The business did well and resulted in many clients that depended on Maxine to help them succeed. She was an active member and officer of the Chamber of Commerce, taking great pride in her civic responsibilities and caring about the community and businesses. After two years of fighting cancer, Maxine sold her business so that she can concentrate her efforts on surviving. Maxine had five children and 11 grandchildren. She loved her family, and as her condition worsened, she noted that she would be unable to enjoy the future with her family. At age 61, Maxine should have had many years left to enjoy life. As her cancer advanced, the doctor would change her medication. Uh, most changes were successful in slowing or arresting the cancer for some period of time, forever giving Maxine and the family hope. Several months before Maxine's death, she noted that the Procreate was no longer working. Procreate is a drug that helps cancer patients to rebuild blood cells and strength between chemo treatments. As a result of the counterfeit drugs, Maxine had to lengthen the time between treatments. This allowed the cancer to advance much more rapidly. After Maxine informed the nurse at the doctor's office that Procreate was not working, it was determined that her medication was counterfeit. She was receiving 5% of the dosage needed. As earlier noted, the counterfeit Procreate prevented Maxine from taking chemo treatments as needed. In addition, she had no strength, more pain, problems concentrating, and felt much worse than she ever had. The missed treatments combined with her loss of confidence in the pharmacy system resulted in the quality of Maxine's life taking a nosedive. It took her hours just to shower and dress. As she dressed, she'd have to take a break between each garment, sometimes have to take a nap between garments. Maxine had ded dedicated all effort to trying to get well or survive until a drug could be developed that would be a cure for her. She had total confidence in her doctor and pharmacy until this happened. She had purchased her drugs at one of the largest and most reliable pharmacies in St. Louis. At first, she blamed the pharmacy. Then she learned that the controls on prescription drugs were not effective and that counterfe counterfeit drugs were not all that uncommon. She was spending thousands of dollars each month on counterfeit drugs and the pharmacy even refused to return her money when they found they were counterfeit. Maxine's confidence was gone. And at this point, she pretty well resigned herself that the end was near. I don't pretend to know that Maxine would be alive today if she had received, not received counterfeit drugs. What I do know is that she would have lived longer, would have experienced much less pain and suffering, and she would have been able to spend more time with her family. Maxine died on October 24, 2002. The criminals that deal in counterfeit drugs are murderers. They steal people's dignity, cause unbelievable pain, and often early death for their victims. When they distribute counterfeit drugs, they have no way to know who the victims will be. Anyone in our families or the counterfeiters' families could be a victim of this crime. I don't understand how these drugs, these criminals can look at themselves in the mirror. In closing, I would like to reiterate that stronger controls would have delayed Maxine's death reduced her suffering, and allowed her to die with more dignity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, each one of you for your testimony, and our sympathy goes out to your families. Uh, appreciate your willingness to speak out and, and share your personal sorrows so that we can try to figure out how best to deal legislatively with this and put uh, uh, as much oversight on this as, as possible. Mr. Uh, Butler, in your testimony, you said that um, they determined that the Procrit was counterfeit. How did that process work? The uh, nurse sent the uh, Procrit that my sister had vial with her. And she sent it to the uh, to a laboratory. The laboratory analyzed it and came back that it was uh, counterfeit. Counterfeit meaning a reduced amount. It was five percent of the uh, of the volume she should have been getting. 
So the, the nurse initiated the process and the hospital paid for the process, is that how? Yes, that's correct. Uh -huh. My sister didn't realize that the reason the drugs had stopped working was because it was counterfeit. She thought it was because the cancer had advanced to a point to where it just wasn't doing any good. Do you know in that case, did the uh, hospital then go to the pharmacy or what happened from there? The hospital notified the pharmacy. My sister notified the pharmacy. Uh, they did uh, investigation from there in terms of where they got the counterfeits from or where they got the medication from. Uh, I don't know the whole story of the, what the pedigree said at the time. Uh, the uh, appropriate had been acquired from the uh, cheapest vendor and they had purchased the drugs from a number, that same type of drug from a number of different vendors. Uh, it, there's specific lot numbers involved and I'm not that familiar with exactly what happened on that side. Mr. Fagan, have you met other people who've been through your uh, problem in the course of uh, exploring this? No, I haven't uh, outside of today. but. Uh, what the unique thing is why, why I believe I haven't is because we were in a very unique situation in that we were in possession of vials. We would receive a month's worth of vials at a time from our pharmacy uh, for Tim's weekly injections. Um, think of how many senior citizens go to the doctor for a shot. The, uh, the injection is administered, the vial goes in the garbage or the same thing in a hospital. So the proof is destroyed the patient doesn't get better and the underlying disease is blamed for what happened. And what the sin of it is is that companies like Amerisos Bergen, large Fortune 500 companies, choose to put profit before patient safety and it is absolutely criminal. What happened to my son is unconscionable. And um, I sit here in, before you and it's just surreal that this thing is even happening. But it is, and that's the, uh, the, the disturbing truth of it, is that this problem potentially affects every American citizen. If it could happen to me, if it could happen to my son, it could happen to anyone. Ms. Ivan, uh, could you describe a, a little bit what you've learned about the gray market? You've te you know, talked about that in, in Mr. Uh, Fagan's case. and. Uh, well, how exactly is this working? Is, it, is that the main source of the, the problem? Uh, clearly, we've heard about the pedigrees. That's a, that's a big uh, problem with it. Uh, and your feeling about, uh, you heard of someone on the first panel going back and forth about how uh, kind of random and rare this is, or is, uh, is it only when we get a very dramatic case that we actually learn of any kind of problem? Um, if I can answer the, the second part of your question first. Um, we don't know how big a problem this is. The FDA put out a report and said that less than 1% of the nation's drug supply is counterfeit. Uh, in my reporting, I went down to Washington and met with the authors of the, the report and asked them, how did you come to that number? And they said to me, basically, uh, well, we don't know, we guessed, but we don't imagine it's any worse. So there haven't been any studies done on this problem. Um, I tend to say, all right, less than 1%, that's a cons they're making what I think is a conservative estimate. If we say 1% of the nation's drug supply is counterfeit, and even that sounds um, conservative and relatively reassuringly small, 1% is 35 million prescriptions a year. And it's likely that that number is concentrated among the high cost brand name pharmaceuticals for the sickest patients who need it the most. The reason being, as committee members have noted, that counterfeiters favor the most expensive drugs as an excellent return on investment. So I think you are looking at a fairly big problem. I'd like to add that when uh, the FDA mentions cases, 32 a year, 58 a year, those cases often represent thousands or hundreds of thousands of counterfeit doses that have potentially reached patients. One of those cases in 2003 was counterfeit Lipitor, and by Pfizer's own estimate, 600,000 uh, tablets of counterfeit Lipitor reached patients. Again, in 2002, Jose Grillo's counterfeiting of 110,000 vials of Epigen and Procrit, um, taking very weak doses and making them look like strong doses, only 13,000 of those vials are recovered, which means that 97,000 vials are estimated to have reached patients. 
I think from these examples we can gather that the problem is fairly big and the numbers demonstrate that it's growing, but because no definitive studies have done, been done, we don't know for sure the size of it. Um, in my reporting, I identified uh, over a dozen patients, but we know that the FDA's MedWatch system has received reports from dozens and dozens and dozens of patients who believe they have received counterfeit medicine. In those dozen patients, uh, when they went into the pharmacy, did you find a consistent pattern that uh, here uh, Mr. Fagan said that uh, actually he was notified indirectly through the pharmacy that to, ch or to check whether it was counterfeit? Right. Mr. Uh, Butler is saying that the nurse sent it out for testing. Mm -hmm. Is that a pretty typical pattern of what you've been seeing or do some of them get non-responsiveness? Um, the way that it's detected is entirely random and um, sadly I have to say that um, Tim Fagan and Maxine Blount are the lucky ones only in the sense that they learned that they had taken counterfeit medicine, whereas many patients never know. They simply don't get better and because they have serious diseases, of course, they don't know why they're not improving. So. Um, in, in my reporting, I began to realize we all know someone whose medicine suddenly stopped working. And once you immerse yourself in this problem, you really do begin to ask yourself why. And you begin to think of a whole new set of reasons why that might have happened. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. First of all, I want to thank uh, all of you for your testimony to Mr. Fagan and to Mr. Butler. I want to thank you for taking your pain and what you've gone through and using it as a passport to hopefully help other people in the future. I'm going to start with you, Ms. Evan, and I'm just curious. Today I note that, um, well, yesterday it was the um, USA Today says effectively immediately that CVS chain said it will purchase pharmaceuticals only directly from manufacturers or from wholesalers who certify they are not buying from what has been dubbed the secondary market. How significant is that? It's very important and it's the right step. And if every pharmacy chain in the United States insisted upon that, I think you would find that the gray market, um, the wholesalers who simply trade sideways among themselves, would shrink considerably. Um, the problem is, is that the reforms that have been taken, the steps that have been announced by players in the supply chain are random, individual, and many loopholes, many doors still remain open. You know, I remember a while back when we had the Tylenol contamination and how it just sent a rippling effect. And now we have these containers and seals and whatever. And when I think about, say, manufacturers, are they, it seems like if they had, if there was any idea, if the word got out that maybe their um, drug had been contaminated in any way, and when I say contaminated, I don't mean, I know these are counterfeits, I understand that, but it has their label, <laughs> has something that, that's supposed to be their label. You, you, seems like that would cause them to really be major players in this. Do you find that to be the case? In other words, trying to help to make sure the problem is solved because if, you, if it gets out there to, that, say, for example, Lipitor is not, is, there's a lot of counterfeit Lipitor out there, then I think that sends a terrible message from an economic standpoint and sadly, Sometimes economics, as is, is I think Mr. Fagan said, is what drives things. Um, I think that uh, manufacturers have changed their stance about the problem. Um, earlier on, as I found, they were not w really willing or likely to raise their hands to say our medicine is being counterfeited for fear that patients would then go to uh, possibly a, um, a rival's medicine um, in order to to uh, try to get safe medicine. Uh, but I think that the problem has grown enough that they have become quite concerned about it. Um, they have ramped up significantly tamper-proof packaging, uh, holograms, um, chemical taggants and markers that are embedded in the packaging or even in the product themselves. 
but many security directors of drug companies I've spoken to said, given 12 to 18 months, counterfeiters can pretty much copy anything. Um, so the approach has to be uh, on many levels to solve the problem. You know, one of the things that you said that just kind of just is stuck in the DNA of every cell in my brain is you said that 1 percent may be as many as 35 million prescriptions? Yes, that's right. Now, did you hear the testimony of the gentleman, Mr. Lutter? Did you hear it from FDA? Yes, I did. Do you think he's underestimating the problem, overestimating, or you don't have a clue? Um, I think that the FDA has always wanted to um, reassure the public that they should take their medicine and that their medicine is safe, but I don't think they really know the size of the problem because they have not done any studies. They are guessing as to the size of the problem, and I do think that historically they probably have played down problems because they don't want to panic consumers. And let me say this to you, Mr. Fagan and Mr. Butler. If this Congress wanted to do this, it could be done overnight, period. It has got to be the will of the Congress to do it. But it can be done. I've seen things much harder than this done. And um, I, I, it would suggest that you keep, keep fighting. I, I'm, I, for one, want to make sure my name is on that bill. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, I think one of the things that should not be lost in all of this is something that you emphasize, Mr. Fagan, and you, Ms. Ebon, you all, and I think you too, Mr. Butler, to a degree. You know, as, I, as you were sitting here think, talking, I was thinking about all the people in my district, and I represent a lot of poor people and lower middle class people. Uh, and I'm sure that in some of those instances, and, and I have a lot of seniors, so they get the medication, and like, like you all said, they may die or may be harmed because they're not getting the right dosage, or they, they may be getting just a completely fake medication with none of the ingredients that it's supposed to have in it. But yet and still when the autopsy is performed or, or when the final report is done, they died because of cancer or whatever it might have been. And so we really don't know. We don't know how many of these people are being affected by, by all of this. And I, I just, I tell you, one of the things I think we must do, and I think all of us, and the reason why this is so significant, this hearing is so significant, and I do compliment you, Mr. Chairman, for putting together an, an, a balance here of witnesses, is because this affects, this can affect every single one of us, all of us. And we do have to have trust in the medicine we take and the food we eat. And so uh, we, I really thank you, and I'm hoping that we will be able to move this along. But thank you all so very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Burton. First of all, uh, let me just say my, you have my sympathy. My, uh, my wife uh, died of uh, liver cancer, and she had breast cancer prior to that, and she took uh, tamoxifen. And when we were going through her chemotherapy and her other treatments, uh, we had ladies that were sitting next to her taking chemotherapy that were talking about tamoxifen and talking about how they couldn't afford it. I, I presume the same thing was true with Procreate. And uh, uh, that's when I started checking with my colleagues about the costs in other countries. In Canada, the things that she was taking was one-fifth, one-sixth what it costs here. And one of the reasons why we have this counterfeit problem, I believe, is because of the price disparity. Because if, you know, what was it? Somebody's going to testify that Willie Sutton said the reason he robbed banks was because that's where the money was. I mean, if it costs six times as much for a product in Canada as it does here, uh, and you can get it or, or counterfeit it, you're going to make a, a lot of money just by doing it here in the, in the United States. But we really do have to do something about the counterfeit problem. I'm not downplaying that. As I understand it, in the case of your sister, the, the druggist took the pill and cut the amount by one-fifth or one-sixth or one-tenth or whatever it was. I, I, I don't know how you deal with that kind of a guy. I mean, he needs to be in the slammer. No question about that. 
And I think the same thing is true when somebody is taking a product that deals with people who suffered from a liver transplant and they start watering it down or anything. Uh, uh, and, and the price disparities, I think, have a lot to do with that as well. I have got a list here of, the, of my colleague, uh, Mr. Goodnick, has compiled on the differences in prices. And one of the Gordian knots that we have to deal with in, in dealing with this problem, in my opinion, is we are in a global marketplace right now. Let us say that we are able to come up with a mechanism to make absolutely sure that every product, that every pharmaceutical product is, is pure and packaged properly in the United States. If it costs so much more like tamoxifen does here than it does in France or Germany, the people who have to rely on that are going to try to get it through the Internet. And then you have to police everything coming through the mail from a foreign country because people are going to buy it where they can afford it if they can, whether it's, whether it's drugs or almost anything. And so what we've got to do is we've got to, and I've sat down with the leaders of the various pharmaceutical companies, Lilly and, and Merck and others, and I said, you know, what we need to do is sit down and talk about some way to come up with a pricing structure that's fair for people in this country as it is elsewhere. And if you do that, you're going to minimize this kind of a problem. There's always going to be people, people that will try to, you know, cut something to make more money. But as long as the money's there to be made, they're going to do it. And so I just, just say that uh, you have my sympathy for what you've gone through. But uh, uh, this is a problem that's not going to be easily solved, as one of my colleagues just said, because you can get it, you can get these products from other parts of the world and you can get them at much lower prices. So the, the, the root cause of it, in my opinion, is trying to come up with some kind of a, not a government imposed price in index, but, but some, some way that we can make sure that the American people are paying a price that's not completely out of line with what they're paying in other parts of the world. And I think that's the reason this whole issue has been, uh, has arisen. Not because we don't have counterfeit products. We've had those for a long, long time. But because the importation of products has become such a big issue that I think the pharmaceutical company and our health agencies have said, hey, we've got to do something to stop this. And one of the main ways to stop that is to start raising cane about uh, counterfeit drugs and, and put the fear of God into everybody that's taking them. It's not to say that there aren't counterfeit drugs. It's not to say that there's unscrupulous pharmacists that are going to cut something to one-fifth of its strength in order to make a buck. You're always going to have people like that. But the main issue, in my opinion, is to try to make sure that Americans pay a fair price just like the rest of the world does for pharmaceutical products. And that's one of the things that Mr. Gudnick and I and others have been working on for a long time. The unfortunate thing is the pharmaceutical industry has over 600 lobbyists in, the United States, in, 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 in Washington, D.C. 600, over 600. There's only 535 members of Congress. So they have a tremendous amount of impact on what we do around here. Plus, they give out millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in, in contributions for campaigns. So they have a tremendous amount of influence. So this problem is very important, Mr. Chairman, in dealing with counterfeit uh, pharmaceutical products. But I think of equal import or, or as much import is, uh, is, is dealing with the disparity in prices, which I think is one of the, is, is the genesis of this, of this problem. And I yield back the balance of my time. Ms. Watson. Uh, these questions go to the author. And listening to the testimony, it seems that the drug, uh, let me address uh, this to Mr. Butler first and then to the author. The drug that your sister was using was a counterfeit drug prescribed or obtained through what process? She had, my sister obtained it uh, by going to the local pharmacy, a very large uh, pharmacy chain, a reputable chain in St. Louis, one of the largest. That's where she got it from. They had purchased it from a, a wholesaler. I and see. where the wholesaler got it, I am not sure. I think uh, Ms. Eben's book indicated it may have came through a strip club in Miami. I am not was sure. Was it prescribed by her doctor? Yes, it was. W would the gentlelady yield real quick? I think it's I something. I certainly will. It's very important. Uh, when the pharmacist got the drug, it was, it was of normal strength, was it not? It was not at normal strength. Well, who, who did the cutting of it? Who cut, yeah. the, cut the, the volume of it down? That was. Prior to, I mean, I'm not sure who did the cutting. Well, okay, I was now, in my. Catherine mind. did the investigation, and she may know. I think she probably does. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. What What I'm trying to 
authors going. I've been reading the bill, and what I'm trying to ferret out is how and what is the procedure would be used to stop this? Because apparently your sister initiated it on her own or the doctor said you need this kind of drug. I'm trying to figure out how we can get to that point where we could uh, prohibit or stop or cease the sale of this counterfeit drug. I don't know where in the system uh, we could go. And I'm looking at the bill to see that uh, it addresses this. There is an investigation. They do ask for additional money in the bill to investigate. But how does the process get started? And I see that the um, sponsor of the bill is not here. And I, I know there's an order to recall drugs, and certainly if the drugs are not. Okay, here's the author. In listening to Mr. Butler, uh, his sister went to a pharmacist and got a particular drug, uh, where in your bill, what provision in the bill would address that? Uh, initiated by, and I didn't know whether it was a doctor's prescription or what, but I think she initiated it herself. It, what, the the doctor prescribed the procreate. Uh, it's necessary to help build blood, the blood and strength back up between chemo treatments. I see. And then when she went to purchase it, she learned afterwards that it was a fake or they were cutting or whatever. I just wanted to know from the author, is there a provision that would address that process? Well, the, the, Mr. Chairman, you're very kind to allow me to introduce my constituent. Do I have your permission to answer the question? Yes, of course. Okay. I appreciate it. Uh, the, one of the most important things that the bill does is provide a, a very significant disincentive uh, to criminals who are counterfeiting drugs by increasing penalties uh, from current federal law of three years in prison to life in prison. Mm. Uh, that would be a very significant penalty. With respect to what immediate action could be taken uh, to prevent the, uh, to deal with the purchase or the acquisition uh, of counterfeit medication, the most important thing we can do is make sure that we have pedigrees, that we know every step, if you look at that chart, every single step that that medication has gone through uh, so that you know that the integrity of that medication has been maintained. And, and the final point I would make uh, is that right now the FDA has no uh, ability, uh, no true ability uh, to recall counterfeit uh, medicines from the pharmacy shelves. It's easier to recall a defective toaster oven in this country than it is to recall counterfeit medications. This would give the FDA uh, the ability uh, to recall counterfeit drugs immediately when there is a report of such drugs. Uh, Mr. Butler, did your sister have a prescription? Yes, she did. From the doctor? Yes, she did. And when she purchased it, she found that it wasn't having the desired effect. And then she found out later it was counterfeit. Yes, she uh, had taken the procreate for some time and had worked very well. Mm -hmm. when it's, and she had gotten that from the same pharmacist. Uh, when it stopped working, she made an assumption that it was because her cancer had worsened and that was the reason it wasn't working. So she didn't immediately tell her doctor. Uh, but she started delaying. It, it got so she had to delay the process before she could go back for chemo. Then uh, when she told the doctor or told the nurse, uh, the nurse sent it in and had it analyzed. The pharmacist did not know the medication was I counterfeit. See. They had purchased it from a wholesaler. I see. In that so, way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to be sure that in the bill, which uh, I'm very sympathetic to, that there is a provision that would require the pharmacist some way to check out those drugs when they get them from a uh, probably unauthorized manufacturer, I don't know. But I'm hoping that this bill would address, you know, how would we attempt to try to save your sister's life through this bill? And I think that something has to be in here to indicate. The pharmacy didn't know, but they purchased it somewhere. And uh, probably whoever was marketing this sold them a bill of goods. Actually, they purchased it from a legitimate wholesaler. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to yield back to the author because uh, it's your bill and you might want to kind of elaborate. 
on Thank that you. issue. Thank uh, you. The, the, the simple answer is, is that the pedigree requirement would have notified the pharmacy immediately uh, that uh, this particular medication uh, did not go through the uh, did not okay. go through the appropriate transactions that it may have gone elsewhere, may have been tampered with, and, and that's what's really at the heart of this bill, uh, is requiring the FDA to implement the paper pedigree uh, that they uh, that was supposed to be uh, implemented 17 years ago. Uh, another question, Mr. Chairman, if I still have time, who would have the authority in that process to? carry this out. You see, apparently the pharmacy purchased a bad batch of this prescriptive drug. It was and we, we, somewhere we have got to stop that kind of thing from happening, if it is a bad batch. The enforcement would be by the FDA. The bill provides an additional $325 million for the FDA for uh, spot checking, additional enforcement, and training pharmacies uh, to okay. uh, be able to recognize potentially uh, counterfeit drugs. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, my heart goes out to you, Mr. Fagan, and to you, Mr. Butler, um, on the situations that you had to deal with. And uh, drugs are very important to all of us. Uh, it allows us to live a lot longer and a lot more comfortably. And so we want to make sure that the drugs we are receiving are the drugs we expect to receive. Um, I think there's two issues that are going on here. Uh, the first is the affordability of drugs in the United States versus the affordability of drugs in Germany and, and Canada and other places. But I think, and, and the second is the, the kind of drugs that we're receiving and are they pure or have they been tampered with. What I'm hearing from Mrs. Eben is that sh the drugs she discovered were not tampered with in Germany or in Ireland or in Canada, they were tampered with in the United States. So, so we have two issues. One is price and an unfairness of the price here in the United States. And the second is the purity of the drugs. I think the second part is easily remedied by putting some sort of a tracking system on those drugs, something like what is in Germany, uh, putting them in the little individual um, uh, tablets, uh, putting a little blister packs. blister packs or putting something like this on them to make sure that the drug is pure. Because when we worry about something coming through, from the through the mail, uh, the insurance policy that, that my husband and I have, our health insurance policy, requires that if we're taking drugs for a long period of time, that we get them through the mail. So worrying about whether you get it through the mail and if it's been tampered with, that's something that's already here. The second thing is trying to make the drug prices more fair to our United States customers. And so I, I worry that any legislation that we pass uh, that uh, tries to correct the first part of it by making sure that our drugs are pure, but doesn't address the price of the drug, uh, will not will not correct the, the purity or the lack of purity of the drug, and so that is my concern. And I know that Mr. Butler and Mr. Fagan probably don't have um, a solid answer for that, Mrs. but Mrs. Eben, do you? Thank you very much. Um, first of all. I think many American consumers assume that when they go to a pharmacy and pay top dollar for their drugs, that their drugs are guaranteed to be safe. But in fact, the soaring prices of our drugs actually puts their safety at risk because America has become a go-to market for counterfeiters. We offer the best return on investment for counterfeiters who want to move their products into our market. Now, my book deals exclusively with counterfeit medicine that has reached consumers through pharmacies and through hospitals and through legitimate mail order. So that is our legitimate drug supply and counterfeit, counterfeits have infiltrated that. I just want to say that in the case of Maxine Blount and Tim Fagan, this was not a case in either situation of a rogue pharmacist diluting drugs or tampering with drugs. This was about systemic 
corruption of our drug supply in which major wholesalers who are responsible, legitimate wholesalers look for bargains or discounts in the secondary market. They buy even from licensed wholesalers, but that medicine still proves to be counterfeit because it doesn't have a proven origin, which is what a pedigree paper would correct. Um, they are looking for discounts in the secondary market because they want to be able to buy low and then sell high. And as we all know, they can sell very high. So these are players whose sole profit is coming from arbitraging the price of the drug. That is that whole gray bandwidth in the middle of that chart. Every single box is a different wholesaler. And the drugs moved through. Every wholesaler bought low and sold high. And it finally got to a um, regional wholesaler and then a national wholesaler once it approached the market rate. Once the price came up, then it could be sold to a pharmacy and ultimately to a consumer. But it is the buying from unknown sources from that gray market that is driving this problem. And that's what needs to be corrected. And so in order to have a record that follows each drug, whoever buys or sells it would need to commit to its origin. And that's extremely important. I, I hope that answers in part your question. Thank you, it does. Mr. Goodney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank all the panelists. And, and I would extend my uh, condolences as well. Uh, and I, finally, I think I understand. Now, Mr. Butler, are you familiar with the case in the Kansas City area of the pharmacist who was intentionally doctoring the, the, the uh, they were principally cancer drugs as well? Yes, I'm familiar. This is not that case, though. It had nothing to this do with that This is a separate whatsoever. case. Okay. Um, secondly, I want to I come back. Uh, Ms. Even, uh, there was a story, and I will submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, uh, an article that appeared within the last two weeks, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal uh, about uh, the Pharmaceutical Marketing Association uh, hiring uh, uh, writers to write a novel. Are you familiar with that story? I am familiar with that story. And in fact, I even heard that the yeah. editor at the publishing house who was going to be uh, editing it was none other than Jason Blair, who is a former colleague of mine from the New York Times. Uh, and that is correct. Uh, just for the record, you are not now or ha and have never been under contract from any of the pharmaceutical companies or the Pharmaceutical Marketing Association? Absolutely not. Thank you. Uh, let me just point out, and I, I didn't know I had this with me, but I would share this with any of the, the people who are here, and I certainly want to share it with other members of, of the committee. This is a, uh, I, I talked earlier about the, uh, the, the new computer chips. In this little vial, there are 50 computer chips. They sell now, I believe, for like 10 cents a piece. They have the ability to do exactly what we're talking about. The FDA has known about these for at least two years because I told them about them. And uh, they have consistently refused to do exactly what we're talking about. And the reason I say that is that, and, and, uh, and I'm certainly empathetic to what we're talking about, and uh, I, I would certainly like to work with the author and with you to come up with a, a safer way to protect our, our, our drug supply. Uh, that has never been my intention. I, what, what I want to make certain is Americans have access to world-class drugs at world market prices. But I'm also going to submit for the record this is, an, it, and I believe this may be from today's, uh, one of today's uh, Hill newspapers. Uh, and it, this is a scare ad, and it's done by pharma. And let me just read for you what it says, real or counterfeit? The answer could be a click away. Well, this is all part of an orchestrated effort to, to make people believe that, gee whiz, if I buy my drugs from that pharmacy in Winnipeg, it may be a counterfeit. The truth of the matter is, with the technology we use in the United States today, you are more likely to get a counterfeit drug if you buy your drug from the local drugstore. Unfortunately, that is a fact. And uh, so in terms of the bill, uh, I certainly want to work with the author. But giving the FDA an army of new inspectors to go out and chase little old ladies who are trying to save $200 on the tamoxifen by buying it from uh, Manitoba is not my idea of really making America safer. Uh, and so I will work with you to, and, and provide you with information on, on this technology. And incidentally, we have the next generation of technology already being developed. They are little digital taggets. And they can be put in every single drug so that we can know exactly what that drug is made of, where it came from, when it came off the production line, right down to the components of that drug. And so there are a lot of things that we can use today, technology right off the shelf, 
We don't have to give the FDA an army of new people. And we don't have to make it even harder for uh, folks in my district to try and save uh, a few hundred bucks a month on their prescription drugs by buying them from a, a, a pharmacy in Canada. And so we want to be careful. And I think uh, our new colleague from the state of Ohio, I think, has is, is really stated it right. There are really several issues at play here. And uh, we want to make certain that people who break the law are held fully accountable. I will say this, though, in all fairness to the life sentence uh, concept. Uh, if we're going to start making mandatory life sentences, I would go first after sex offenders. Because we have a, you know, every day there are stories in the papers, both here and, and throughout the United States, of sex offenders who are turned back out in the streets after only a couple of years. And they, they have the highest rate of recidivism of anybody. And, and finally, Mrs. Eben, I, I just want to come back to another point that you made. Um, there is, going back to the scare tactics of pharma, the truth of the matter is I know that there's a lot of, there is a certain amount of counterfeiting going on. But some of it is so good that it is virtually impossible to tell the real from the imposter. And the bottom line is if you are getting a counterfeit that is an exact copy of the name brand drug, ultimately what is the harm to the consumer? And, I, and I, I have a very good example that, that, that I've been told. And, 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 the, and the example uh, is uh, of one of the male enhancement drugs. Uh, you can buy them in India for 10 cents a tablet. Here they're $10 a tablet. There are counterfeiters. You may call them counterfeiters. I would call them entrepreneurs that are bringing them in and selling for $5. But the net result to the consumer is exactly the same. Um, if I may. Uh, unfortunately, though, counterfeiters don't provide a guarantee that the effect on the consumer will be the same. Right. And so it's a crapshoot. Of course, if it is exactly the same and it's less money, the consumer benefits, but there is no guarantee of that. I also want to say that there has been testimony, um, I believe it was before Congress in the last year, which said that the terrorist organization of Hezbollah was counterfeiting uh, Viagra and selling it within the United States. So we certainly do know that uh, terrorists do look at counterfeiting as, um, as an activity that can build profits for whatever work that they are doing. And they also do not provide any guarantees, of course. Well, if you're in the crime business, I mean, clearly, you look at this and the, the potential you know, is hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So I would not be surprised that there are all kinds of organizations out there who have looked at this business and said, you know, if you can buy something for a dime and sell it for $5, you can make a lot of money on that 50% uh, that markup. I yield back my time. Mr. Burton. I have one real quick question. First of all, I want to just say that uh, you can see the computer chips in this vial. And so there is technology, as Mr. Gutnick has said, that can be utilized to track these mm -hmm. things. Uh, the one thing I'd like to reemphasizes what you just said a minute ago, and I hope it's not lost on the rest of the audience tonight and everybody else who's paying attention to this, and that is the huge price disparity is an encouragement for counterfeiters. I'd like for you just to elaborate on that one more time. Because of this huge price disparity between U.S. product sold here and maybe mm -hmm. someplace else in the world, that is an encouragement for counterfeiters, right? I would agree with that statement. I will say that traditionally, uh, counterfeiting in the uh, legitimate drug supply, even in Canada, for example, <laughs> has been lower because their prices are regulated and counterfeiters breed when there is a differential in the prices because that leads to a growing gray market where drugs are diverted and then obtained by counterfeiters. So low prices and regulated prices do decrease the instances of counterfeiting, but the more that we have a global market where with differentials in, in different markets, differing prices in differing markets, and you have more parallel trade, then you will see an increase in counterfeiting. We've seen this recently in the European Union, where now um, England has had counterfeiting incidents, um, uh, and other countries because the drugs are cheaper in Portugal and Spain. That increases the number of middlemen. It increases the number of counterfeiters. So the more that we can reduce prices and regulate the discrepancies or decrease the discrepancies in prices, you will see, I believe, a reduction in counterfeits. Thank you. Thank you. Before going to the third panel, I've listened to two panels uh, of two of my uh, good friends and colleagues, in effect, uh, 
try to take this subject, in my opinion, off hearing. So first I'm going to ask to insert into the record, fake drugs nightmare comes to haunt Canada, uh, into the record. Uh, I also want to point out that Mexico is shipping incredible amounts of, of drugs in the United States where we do not have uh, the assurances that we have from Canada. I've been back and forth on the Canada uh, legislation myself. But the fact is, is that we don't even know that the Canadian pharmacies on the Internet are in Canada. All they have to have is an address shipping through Canada. And that uh, this hearing was not to talk about what I would say is let the buyer beware type situations. In other words, uh, if you want to buy on the Internet, you know you're taking a certain amount of risk. You cannot verify the names. You cannot verify anything other than the shipping address. That if you buy at a flea market, you have less protection. If you buy it from somebody in a, selling out of the back of the end of a station wagon, you have different risk. You may save uh, money, but you know you're taking somewhat let the buyer beware if you want to go that. What we're talking about in this hearing are going through legitimate structures where, in fact, the question is, is if you believe in an FDA, if you believe in a Food and Drug Administration, do you then, if you're going to pay the price at the drugstore, if you're going to pay the market price, are you then guaranteed or what reasonable guarantee do you have that it's safe? Now, everybody agrees that the bigger the price gap, the more people are going to cheat. But in this subcommittee, we have heard in multiple different types of, of testimony, for example, uh, uh, people in confiscated projects, products will do this at a $4 gap if they can get enough, uh, uh, enough um, uh, uh, quantity uh, or even in a small-time small -time operator. Furthermore, copyright law does in fact matter in the United States and the record should show that my good friend from Minnesota is incorrect and mildly encouraging uh, industry saying, look, as long as it's the same CD, as long as it's the same, quite frankly, spam, it does in fact matter whether somebody's stolen the spam label and sells the same quality spam, which is made in my colleague's district, uh, sells that for the, the same thing. Yes, it's not a safety question then. Yes, it's not a, uh, uh, a question of whether or not somebody's going to die from it. But Mr. it Chairman? is a question of copyright law. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, I, I agree with that, and I believe in intellectual property rights, but th this is a special class of products. Intel, for example, does not get the same protection for its, its intellectual property that the drug companies get. The drug companies are the only companies in the United States of America that get to control the product after the first customer. But, but you should... And if, 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 if Intel decides to sell its chips in Japan for one-fifth of what they're selling them in the United States, Distributors in the United States could buy them from, from the Japanese Reclaiming sources. Reclaiming my time, that does not give, or nor should we encourage anybody to violate the national intellectual property rights or claim that those things aren't. In other words, the criteria here isn't, look, as long as it's a good counterfeit, it's okay, and that we don't like this particular law, so it's okay. You don't, you, I mean, if you want to change the law, fine. Chairman, that was not my point. I, I, I want to make it clear. I do not encourage people to, to uh, break the law or take illegal drugs, okay? All I'm saying is that, that when we talk about counterfeit drugs, we're not always talking about people being actually harmed. But the, the price differential is encouraging more well, and more true. arbitrage and more and more illegal activity. People aren't harmed on counterfeit and dollar bills And we have an FDA that, that, that has turned the other way on the technology that exists today. Instead of yeah. doing what their job of, of coming up with technologies uh, they have gone out chasing little old ladies who are trying to save money on their tamoxifen. Uh, I'm sorry, that is not the evidence that we heard today. That is a, a claim, but it is not the evidence we heard of the 56 cases or the, the people we're hearing on this that they're chasing, uh, they're chasing, trying to figure out how to make the American supply uh, uh, safe. And also, as I raise in my opening testimony, which we'll probably get into more in the third panel, the fact is that as we look at the flu shots are about to come up. We, we have a huge problem if that starts to go into counterfeiting and we try to, to vaccinate on the Asian flu virus or on anthrax. Well, we've seen this type of thing. We have terrorism questions. We have other types of questions regarding to in the United States, when we do we believe in a Food and Drug Administration or not? That is a legitimate question. The international question, uh, buying on the Internet, the, the, the internationalization of this is a separate question and a difficult part of this and the pricing question and the pharmaceutical companies is a difficult part of this. But the fact is, is our focus is on counterfeiting in the United States 
and how this relates not only to the terrible tragedies that have happened to your families, but what in fact could really become a huge question as we deal with terrorism, border, and other types of questions. And as I, I have pointed out earlier, as we're trying to, to do the regulations that we're trying to do here are very similar to the types of controls that we're having on, on how we address pseudoephedrine and methamphetamine. And I've been immersed in that up to my head. Uh, but it's a question of whether it comes across the border. It's a question of are India and China producing it? Uh, are you going to have a paper tracking or are you going to have computer tracking? Uh, is it going to be in pill form or in raw federal form? We deal with this type of thing all the time in this subcommittee and other places. What we haven't dealt with is this particular type. And I appreciate your willingness to come forward today and to, to speak out. And hopefully we can, uh, if not move some legislation, at least get FDA to get the uh, initial steps in that they should have, in my opinion, done some time ago. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And we'll thank now you. move to the third panel. Mr. Uh -huh. The third panel consists of Mr. Peter Pitts, Center for Medicines in the Public Interest, uh, Ms. Carmen Catazon, Executive Director of the National Association of the Boards of Pharmacy, Jim Dahl, former Assistant Director of Investigations, FDI Office of Criminal Investigations, and Mr. Donald De Kiefer, uh, De Kiefer and Horgan, uh, I thank you all for coming. And if you'll uh, uh, stand so I can swear you in, you raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you give today is the truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, sir. Let, each of the, let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. Thank you for your uh, patience during this hearing. And we'll start with Mr. Pitts. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Pitts, and I'm a senior fellow for health care studies at the Pacific Research Institute and director of PRI's Center for Medicines in the Public Interest. I'm also a former associate commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration, um, also a 10-year uh, resident of Indianapolis. So it's nice being on a, a Hoosier-based committee. I'd like to thank the committee and, and Mr. Chairman for giving me the opportunity to testify on the urgent and dangerous problem of international prescription drug counterfeiting. The business of creating, distributing, and selling counterfeit pharmaceutical products is a criminal and growing part of the global economy. When asked why he robbed banks, Willie Sutton, the desperation era desperado, replied, because that's where the money is. And if Sutton were alive today, he'd be selling counterfeit prescription drugs. The bad news is that international prescription drug counterfeiting is on the rise. I estimate that by 2010, counterfeit pharmaceutical commerce will go to become 16 percent of the total size of the legitimate global pharmaceutical industry, a six-point percentage increase from 2004. This illegal business will generate $75 billion in revenue for its owners in 2010, a 92 percent increase from today. Consider this. The growth in counterfeit drugs is outpacing the sale of legitimate pharmaceuticals, and the Internet is becoming the 21st century's virtual drug cartel. The World Health Organization, the WHO, estimates that between 8 and 10 percent of the global medicine supply chain is counterfeit, rising to 25 percent or higher in some countries, as already mentioned. The largest counterfeit market with close proximity to the EU, the European Union free trade zone, is Russia where the generally accepted estimate is that 12 percent of drugs are counterfeit. Now that the Baltic nations of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia have joined the European Union, WHO has warned that an increase in the risks of counterfeits entering the EU supply chain is, quote, obvious. Two news items recently crossed the wires that illustrate this growing problem and its truly global nature. The first story from China tells of 11 Chinese nationals and one American invested in a counterfeit medicine scheme that spanned 11 countries, 440,000 bogus pills, and 4.3 million U.S. dollars. The drugs being peddled were Lipitor, Viagra, Cialis, and, Lipit and uh, Levitra. The nations involved were the U.S., Great Britain, Switzerland, and Israel. The second, more frightening news item comes from Hamilton, Ontario, where, where a registered pharmacist, Abadir Nazar, was charged by Canadian federal authorities with selling counterfeit, counterfeit Norvask heart medication after five customers who bought it died of heart attacks and strokes. And the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, announced multiple investigations remain open in other parts of the country. Attention must be paid to this very serious global problem because it is nothing short of international health care terrorism. I've just returned from Europe and they've got a lot of problems over there. One of them is that profiteers masquerading as pharmacists are selling unsafe, 
unregulated, mislabeled, repacked, and commingled drugs to unsuspecting consumers. In Europe, the cause of this malaise is known as parallel trade, and it's bad medicine. According to the Treaty of Rome, parallel trade is completely legal, and Articles 30 and 36 prohibit manufacturers from managing their European supply chains in their own patients' interests, and counterfeiters are taking advantage of this opportunity. For example, in 2002, a wholesaler in the Basel region of Switzerland was caught selling repackaged drugs to Germany worth about 23 million Swiss francs, about 18 million US dollars, and two years later, Swiss Customs seized HIV medications that had been stolen from a batch sent to Africa by the World Health Organization. Swiss Medic, which is Switzerland's FDA, is also concerned about the quantity of fake drugs available on the internet. According to the Swiss authorities, there are 15 big cases in Europe right now and, quote, there is big money involved, close quote. Last year, 140 million individual drug packages were parallel imported throughout the European Union, and a wholesaler repackaged each and every one of those 140 million packages. This means that literally, parallel traders open 140 million packets of drugs, remove the contents, and repackage them. But these parallel profiteers are not in the money-making, they are strictly in the money-making business, not in the safety business. And mistakes happen. For example, new labels incorrectly state the dosage strength. The new label says the box contains tablets, but inside are capsules. The expiration date and batch numbers on the medicine boxes don't match the actual batch and dates of expiration on the medicines inside. And patient information are often in the wrong language or out of date. Drugs purchased from a British pharmacy and sent to an unknown, unknowing American consumer could come from the European Union, from nations such as Greece, Latvia, Poland, Malta, Cyprus, or Estonia. In fact, parallel traded medicines account for about 20 percent, one in five, of all prescriptions filled by British pharmacies. In the EU, there is no requirement to record the batch numbers of parallel imported medicines. So if a batch of medicines originally intended for sale in Greece is recalled, tracing where the entire batch has gone, for example, from Athens to London through Canada to Indianapolis, is impossible. Buyer beware is bad health care practice and even worse health care policy. Safety cannot be compromised even if the truth is inconvenient. Facts are stubborn things and false profits result in deadly consequences. Thank you. Our se second witness is uh, Carmen uh, Catazone, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. We've submitted written comments and I'd like to vary from that testimony to address some of the issues that have been raised earlier by representatives. First of all, uh, as the association represents state agencies, we are not opposed to federal legislation and are willing to work with the industry in developing effective federal legislation. Even though federal preemption concerns the state agencies, we believe there's probably a compromise that can be worked. I want to point out that the state of Indiana recently enacted legislation and regulation that addresses many of the concerns that the representatives have raised today. It provides for accountability of the wholesalers. It provides for accreditation of those wholesalers to verify that they are legitimate and they are engaging in legitimate business operations. Contrary to the criticism of the state regulations that are being enacted and passed, I would say there's more similarity than dissimilarity among the state regulations. What I would ask the subcommittee to consider, though, is enacting any federal legislation to not be lulled by the promises that federal legislation will cure everything. We've been waiting 17 years not for the FDA to implement the pedigree standards, but for the industry to agree to those standards which they've fought and stayed for the past 17 years. If the industry does not want to put forth an earnest effort to enact effective legislation like it's been enacted in Florida, California, and most notably Indiana, then we ask you not to support that legislation, but to support what the states are doing one by one to try and create uniform legislation across the country. In regard to pedigrees, the issue of counterfeit drugs can be resolved almost quickly by tracing that product from the manufacturer through the wholesaler through the pharmacy. Again, the industry has fought the pedigree requirements tooth and nail. In the states, where we've enacted requirements to say, let us use pedigree requirements that are paper, the industry has said it's too costly. When the states have said we'll rely on RFID technology and trace and track technology and implement that as the technology is developed, the industry has said that technology will not be available to 2011. We can't wait that long. 
when we've said let's implement this process through a paper and an electronic transition, the industry has fought that also. We've tried to work with the industry in implementing what is normal distribution, what restricts the product from the secondary markets, what tracks that product from the wholesaler or manufacturers of the pharmacy, and we've not received the cooperation that we think is needed from the industry. So the chips, which Representative Gutnick says is available, we know it's available. All you have to do is talk to people in Florida and California about the resistance that the industry is giving them to implementing these programs, and you'll see that unless the industry is forthright in federal legislation, all we're going to do is stop the momentum that the states have created and put another staying process in place that could last another 17 years. NABP, as the, state, as the association represents state agencies, has revised its model rules for the licensure of wholesale distributors to assist states in revising requirements for state licensure and the regulation of wholesale distributors. We've created and maintained a national specified list of susceptible drug products to identify products that have been counterfeited and or are likely to be counterfeited. We've made operational the verified accredited wholesale distributors program, which is now required by Indiana and by default has set a national standard for the licensure and accreditation of wholesale distributors because very few wholesalers operate only in Indiana. Wholesalers that are licensed in Indiana, which number 600, are doing business interstate. And those wholesalers that have applied for our accreditation to date have been very happy with the process and very complimentary of the state of Indiana and the process that's put in place. In fact, we will probably con conclude some investigations and inspections this week of wholesalers who have applied, applied for accreditation. And that accreditation includes criminal background checks, authentication, due process, pedigree requirements, everything that people this, this afternoon discussed as being necessary to protect the nation's drug supply. NABP and the State Boards of Pharmacy consider the problem of counterfeit drugs a significant concern that must be addressed immediately and effectively. The present regulatory safeguards which have been changed and strengthened in response to the FDA's report on counterfeit drugs require additional resources and support from state and federal legislatures to ensure that the U.S. medication distribution system is not compromised. The cooperation among the states and the FDA is also critical for the success of any effort to maintain the integrity of the, and security of the U.S. medication distribution system. The collaboration between the FDA, NABP, and the state boards of pharmacy to combat the threat of counterfeit drugs have been growing and increasing and need to continue to grow and increase as new challenges are faced and new strategies are developed. If we do not have that support and that cooperation and the, co and the U.S. medication distribution system is compromised by counterfeit drugs, then federal and state agencies will power be powerless to create a situation where citizens will be protected. If that situation occurs, no one will be protected and no one will be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dahl. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important issue. I appear before you as a private citizen, with one, but one with considerable knowledge on this topic. I retired from the FDA Office of Criminal Investigations just one month ago today. In my brief remarks today and in my more thorough submission for the record, I hope to, re to represent the interests and opinions of the 185 special agents of FDA's Office of Criminal Investigations who are the true experts on counterfeit drugs and related pharmaceutical crimes. The wholesale drug distribution system in this country is easily corrupted through the introduction of diverted, stolen, misbranded, illegally repackaged, expired, previously dispensed, counterfeit, or otherwise suspect drugs. Substandard, dangerous, unapproved, and sometimes counterfeit drugs are frequently sold via large, anonymous, largely anonymous and unregulated websites and small parcels containing unknown, misbranded, unapproved, and counterfeit drugs are flooding our borders. Couple all that with the possibility for terrorist exploitation of our vulnerabilities, and one can easily see we have an enormous problem on our hands. So what should we do? First, fully implement the PDMA regulations requiring a pedigree on wholesale distribution of prescription drugs. Although the underlying law has some loopholes, the pedigree regulations as currently written 
would help control unscrupulous wholesalers and provide evidence and information useful to OCI in its criminal investigations. OCI has recommended to the greater FDA the full implementation of the pedig pedigree rule since it was originally proposed in 1999 and it is now time for Congress and the American public to demand that the stay on those regulations be lifted. Second, call for new legislation that would help OCI and others in their criminal investigations. I'd like to highlight just a few needs. Administrative subpoena authority for use by OCI agents in their felony investigations should be authorized. This is a very effective tool commonly used by a number of other agencies, including the IRS and, and the Bureau of Immigration and Customs Enforcement and every inspector general in the government. If a HUD OIG agent can use an administrative subpoena to collect documentary evidence concerning false statements on a mortgage application, I'm sure the American public would agree that an OCI special agent should be able to use a similar tool to gather evidence concerning criminal organizations that would deliver substandard or counterfeit drugs to an unsuspecting patient in a hospital. Title 18 of the United States Code needs to be amended to make the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act felonies predicate offenses under the racketeering statutes and specified unlawful activities for money laundering. Most offenses are committed for economic gain. OCI needs these tools to effectively attack the criminal enterprises that put public health at risk. In addition, Title 18 needs to be amended to allow, upon conviction, the direct forfeiture of the gross proceeds from felony violations of the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act. This not only helps punish the defendant for his illegal actions, but is effective in dismantling the criminal enterprise that could otherwise continue to prey upon the public. Title 21 of the U.S. Code needs to be amended to provide for higher maximum penalties for violations, felony violations of the Act. I would suggest that the penalties be linked to the actual or potential harm caused by the illegal conduct in a manner similar to that provided under the Federal Anti-Tampering Act. It does not make sense that a person risks up to a 10-year maximum sentence for counterfeiting a registered trademark, but only up to three years for counterfeiting a drug. Title 21 of the U.S. Code also needs to be amended to modernize and improve enforcement generally. For instance, the definition of what constitutes a counterfeit drug should be broadened. A provision making the attempted commission of a FD&C Act felony needs to be enacted. A sting provision needs to be included to improve on the effectiveness of undercover operations. And seizure laws at ports of entry need to be streamlined to allow efficient and effective seizures and disposition of violative products. My third suggestion for dealing with counterfeit drugs and related pharmaceutical crime is one of resources. OCI's operational budget for FY05 was only $3.96 million. Yet at any given time during that year, OCI had an inventory of 800 to 900 open and active investigations, many assess addressing the priority issues spoken of today along with others involving such diverse and important matters as consumer product tampering, medical device crimes, false statements to the agencies, illegal trade in human tissue for transplant, adulted biologics, etc. Yet it appears to me that OCI has become a victim of its own success. I believe OCI provides the agency with its biggest bang for the buck, yet it is being asked again to do more with less. OCI simply needs more operational funding and more people to adequately address the increasingly complex criminal cases that appear on the horizon each day. Resources are always a sensitive issue, but the time has come that we must confront the, this crime problem with real solutions. As a start, a mere million dollars in operational funding, along with a couple of dozen fully funded FTEs, would go a long way to addressing these issues. In conclusion, I would like to compliment the men and women of OCI and the United States Attorney's offices around the country for their continued dedication and resourcefulness in investigating and prosecuting pharma crime. Every day they are out there doing interviews, conducting surveillance, testifying in court, making arrests, and much, much more. Without their continued good work, this country would be facing even greater problems. I also believe that we need to remember that, o that FDA's overall mission is extremely important and complex.
but the problem of criminal attacks against the pharmaceuticals we all rely on cannot be solved with a status quo Office of Criminal Investigations. The FDA must confront drug counterfeiting and pharmaceutical crime as a law enforcement problem. It must continue to seek and seriously consider advice from the true experts within and outside the agency and adopt a political will to provide law enforcement with the tools and resources it needs. Thank you. Mr. DeKiefer, is it? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to uh, depart from my prepared testimony to uh, address some of the issues that have been raised in the hearings today. Um, as we've all heard, the counterfeit drug problem in the United States is, is very severe and it's getting worse. But it's not as severe as it is in many other countries, including countries all over Europe. The European um, uh, market right now uh, has approximately five times the number of counterfeits that we do. So the mere fact that a country uh, has lower drug prices does not necessarily mean it will axiomatically have lower counterfeits. There are three major sources of counterfeit drug supply in the United States, though, and I uh, cross-border imports, uh, the Internet, and diversion. I really don't want to spend too much time on talking about the imported, uh, import question today. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, that's a, maybe that's a topic for another day. And the Internet itself could take up hearings all, uh, all by itself. The fact is, though, that diversion has been the source of all of the counterfeit drugs that have entered the legitimate drug supply chain in this country in the last five years. I'm not talking about drugs that are purchased over the Internet. I'm not talking about drugs that are purchased by people that are going to Mexico and bringing it across, back across the border or people that are buying it in back alleys. I'm talking about people going to legitimate pharmacies expecting to get legitimate drugs. In every case that we've seen in the last five years that, that's, that we've seen counterfeits, it's because of diversion. Now, in the case of uh, the sources of diverted drugs, you know, where do these come from? Well, there are about seven major sources. There are samples, stolen products, re-imports, own-use pharmacy fraud, to, who, to which you refer, Mr. Chairman, a Medicare and, and Medicaid fraud, complicity and conspiracy with pharmaceutical company representatives, and so-called surplus medications. Now, the problem is the supply chain is not controlled by the manufacturers, uh, and it's not supervised by any regulator nationally. Now, when we talked today, we used the word the industry uh, in kind of a, an umbrella here. The, the drug supply uh, to going from the manufacturer to the retailer is not one industry. It's three and arguably up to five different industries. So, and each of these industries, if you will, has slightly different interests. So when we heard today that the industry opposes uh, this particular proposal or the industry supports this particular approach, we have to be very careful in what industry specifically we're talking about. The diversion pipeline itself, once you open that diversion pipeline from one of the sources that I mentioned, stolen products, re-imports, own use pharmacy, fraud, uh, whatever, once the pipeline is open to get into the legitimate supply chain, that is where the, all of the counterfeits that have entered that chain have, have gotten in. That's the way they get into the, store, the shelves of the CVS and the Rite Aids and that sort of thing. So if you attack diversion and cut that out, you axiomatically cut out the likelihood or reduce the likelihood to near zero of counterfeit drugs getting on legitimate pharmacy shelves. Consumers themselves really are defenseless. They can't tell what legitimate packaging is or what it isn't because, as we know in this country anyway, uh, we don't get drugs in packages or, or RX drugs. We get them in little amber bottles. Maybe there's an, an amber bottle producers association out there making sure that they uh, uh, don't have packaging and anything else aside from amber bottle, but that's the way it has been. In Europe, by contrast, as Congressman, you pointed out, blister packs and are called unit dose is ubiquitous and has been for the past 10 years. That creates some of its own problems, but by and large, they have had far fewer instances because of that kind of packaging than we have in this country. And that certainly is one of the things that can be done. Because the kinds of marketing that you're talking about, Congressman, RFID among others, and the RFID is only one of the solutions, 
is much easier to do if you have packaging that actually reaches the pharmacist and ultimately the consumer. And right now, that entire process is interdicted in the middle of the supply chain. Um, evidence is destroyed during the process of, uh, of consum consumption, too. So there's no way that a consumer or even the FDA OCI can tell whether the incidence of, of counterfeiting is increasing or not. There are a number of solutions that I've recommended in my written statement. Let me just mention just a couple more. One, I would like to underscore what Mr. Dahl said. We have fewer than 200 agents in FDA OCI as our uh, defense against counterfeit drugs in the entire United States with an operating budget of less than $3 million. Some gas stations have bigger operating budgets like than that. It's a scandal and a disgrace. It is, it is something that has not been before, brought before this committee, or I dare say any other committee before, because the FDA uh, budgetary process doesn't permit it. The other recommendations that I've had, though, are in my written testimony. I'd be more than happy to answer questions about them in the question and answer session, and I thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Well, thank you all for your testimony. I'm, I'm, one thing I've been confused about today is, is uh, the multiplicity of possible conspiracies here. Uh, uh, it's unclear to me who, who favors what. On the one hand, a couple of my colleagues are suggesting that this is the whole idea of, of um, counterfeit drugs is something that pharmaceutical companies are, are uh, proposing. Uh, that um, uh, what I thought I heard Mr. Uh, um, Catazone uh, imply was is that there's a danger that um, uh, the, the the I thought you were saying that the pharmaceutical companies or others were opposing regulation. Is that what you were in effect saying? Uh, I mean to clarify that there's been opposition to different aspects of regulation in regard to tighter control over the wholesale distributors. The pharmaceutical industry, and particularly Pfizer, has taken a lead role in this regard. But in regard to the chips and the RFID technology, uh, there's some confusion as to which in the industry support that and which don't. I think overall, in this instance, the manufacturers are very supportive because they want to protect th their products and make sure that the right products are reaching. The wholesaler industry is the one that's been opposing the regulation that we've been pushing at the state level. And, and you're concerned that if Congress passes a bill uh, that the wholesale industry would weaken it so that it wouldn't be implemented and undermine strict state laws? Is that, was that the thrust? Well, that's one of our concerns. We've had recent discussion with the industry that's assured us that this won't occur. But if you look at some of the facts that have been presented and some of those were in, were in Catherine's books, the wholesale industry says that this represents less than 1 percent of their business, that they're, they're going to stop doing business with the secondary markets. If that's the case, why is there so much resistance to any regulation? Second, now that the states have gained momentum and are passing regulations and creating the uniformity, why is the industry coming forth now calling for federal legislation? We've also not heard the wholesalers support Representative Israel's bill at the federal level, but instead want to introduce their own bill. Our accreditation program is moving along. We have over 100 field investigators that are ready to inspect, and soon we'll have over 200 ready to move in any state at a moment's notice. We think that the industry realizes that the states have taken this seriously and the states are not going to back down. And so now there's an attempt to say, let's try something federally that could weaken what the states have done. Um, Mr. Dahl, uh, how would you characterize the uh, types of investigations you were doing? Uh, uh, would you say that in your, when you were at, at CSI, is that? Is that, that's a TV show, is that the? Yeah, OC, the OCI. OCI. We, don't, we don't have a TV yeah. show yet. Yeah. The OCI, yeah. Well, if we get you that much money, maybe you'll get a TV show <laughs> if we get that many investigators. Uh, that uh, at OCI, um, were these invest, let me ask you two questions and then I'll let that. Uh, do you believe that the investigations were driven by the pharmaceutical companies desired on the import question or do you believe that they're driven more by we've had a rise in counterfeiting, uh, and is the and the the types of threat of the counterfeiting. In other words, did you chase down people who were buying pills on the internet uh, because of the cost, or were you focusing on broader investigations that might have had more threats to safety, or is it a little bit of both, uh, protecting 
uh, international patents and so on and some of its uh, safety questions. And then this, the second, uh, well, why don't you take that one? That was a pretty big question. Well, it's, it's a little bit of both. Certainly we've had criminal investigations involving illegal internet sales. or There is no crime of selling drugs by the internet, but if you sell a, def a defective product, an illegal product, you commit certain crimes. So certainly we have had criminal investigations there. We certainly have had some criminal investigations with small parcels uh, and large parcels being smuggled in from foreign countries, and we certainly have had criminal investigations involving uh, uh, wholesale distribution of counterfeit uh, or misbranded or stolen or illegally repackaged drugs. Uh, we have not had any criminal investigations on little old ladies crossing into Canada buying drugs. Uh, we are not focusing on that. We are not bringing cases like that. Do you, uh, do you sense and is there any preemptory type of looking at or should this be part of the variable of, of uh, I don't know how, how to say this. In other words, how, how would you prioritize investigations? One would suggest if there's a big price gap, smuggling operations are going to occur, that we've been debating that today. Also high risk terrorist type actions, are we, are we doing sampling on, on vaccinations or things that are, are vulnerable, a little bit more proactive rather than just reactive? Are there uh, some drugs where they <clears throat> become essential to life, where an adulterated drug has a different threat than an aspirin, uh, although any drug totally tampered with could be a threat. How, how would you address that, Mr. Dahl, and then Mr. DeKeefer, if you've got any? Well, o OCI prioritizes its investigations based on harm to individuals. Uh, the economic fraud that may be present is, is always secondary. We will always compromise a criminal investigation uh, in favor of public health, and we certainly have announced uh, recalls and, and recoveries of products and given public warnings uh, that would have in another agency not been done because the investigation was still underway. But we can't afford to risk the public health. So whether it's a counterfeit drug, uh, a medical device that could uh, have a serious impact on an individual, uh, tissue for transplant, uh, whatever it might be, the blood supply, we're always going to prioritize the public health and I don't think that will ever change. Mr. Chairman, if I can respond, the list of drug products that we've prepared is based upon criteria that address the high price pharmaceuticals. So they will counterfeit an epigen or procrit versus an amoxicillin. They're also based upon limited distribution, specialized patient cares like HIV AIDS patients. That list has been compiled based upon the facts and based upon some of the concerns which other representatives have raised today. One of the uh, major issues that I think misunderstanding about what is likely to be counterfeited first uh, is that the higher priced item will necessarily be counterfeited first. That's almost never the case. Uh, the product that will be counterfeited first, whether it's drugs or almost anything else, is where the margin is the greatest. Uh, the, in other words, the opportunity to make the greatest markup, number one, and number two, where the likelihood of being, being caught is the lowest. In other words, so the, the ease with which you can pass the product off and the margin you can make will be the magnets for, uh, for counterfeiting in, in almost any circumstance, and it's particularly true with drugs. Um, when certain states, for example, Florida, made up lists of drugs that they did it a few years ago with a little bit more than 30 drugs that they wanted to look at most carefully, um, they really didn't pick drugs that were most likely to be counterfeited. They picked drugs that were um, the most likely to have uh, some effect on people. And I think a combination of those two approaches, one, the most likely to be counterfeited, and secondly, the drugs most likely to cause harm if they are, is the correct way to go about it. I think, Mr. Chairman, to that point as well, the drugs that are most likely not to be counterfeited are drugs that are going to do extreme damage to the consumer because that's basically killing off the business. I think when you see drugs such as Viagra or antidepressant pills that are counterfeited, they are also the least likely to be reported for obvious reasons. So I think that you're looking for counterfeiters who are looking to make as big a margin as possible for as long as possible. This is not a one-shot operation. These people, this is, it's big business and, they, and they want to be in business for a long time. Mr. Burton. Uh, do any of you represent the pharmaceutical industry? <clears throat> My law firm um, provides data to about 50 different companies, among them are for some pharmaceutical industry. We uh, 
provide data on uh, diverters and counterfeiters internationally, uh, and among our, some of our clients are pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. uh, about a third of our clients are pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And also, the, uh, the Pacific Research Institute accepts funding from pharmaceutical companies, but I'm funded from general funding. I'm uh, unemployed, Mr. Burton. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's, you got, a, <laughs> he's got a pension, a TV <laughs> show coming. Uh, you know, let, let's say we pass the legislation to which you referred, and it sounds like to me that there's some real merit in a number of the things that you brought up today. I, I think I've already asked for a copy of the Indiana statute, so Thank we you. may look at that as a model for federal legislation if necessary. But what, what I want to find out is, let's say we pass uh, everything that you say we ought to pass and, and it becomes law. Uh, how do you deal with the people that buy pharmaceutical products from Canada or Mexico or France or Germany and buy them through the Internet? If I could speak to uh, maybe the 185 uh, OCI agents, we aren't dealing with them at all. We're not worried about somebody buying a small parcel from a brick and mortar pharmacy in Winnipeg. We're worried about the 10,000 pills that come in a 75 pound package from Thailand with no labels on it at all. Okay, they get put in other boxes and sure. resold. No, I, okay, that's good. Well, but so then you, 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 you really don't have a, a opposition to the importation of individuals getting pharmaceutical products from Canada or Let's face it, we have importation. There is import, there's probably 10,000 parcels that came in while we've been sitting in this room this afternoon. Uh -huh. uh, so we have it. If you want to pass a law to better regulate it, I think you should. If you don't, it doesn't matter. We're still going to have it. Although, and the FDA knows that, and so yeah. does everyone else. Although, Mr. Burton, to your, to your point, I think it's important not to send the wrong signals. You know, clearly, when you tell people that drugs from other countries are safe and it's okay to get them from the Internet with all the best intentions and all the best... No, I understand. It, it, it also, it, it's some people that aren't necessarily listening quite as carefully. What they hear is it's okay to get drugs yeah. from non-regulated well, we, non, non, non entities. We, we've had legislation in both the House and the Senate that got a lot of support. We've never gotten them both together. We'll, we continue to work on that. Uh, dealing primarily with Canada because they have pretty strict regulations on pharmaceutical products up there. And uh, we, we keep getting opposition, and yet when Mr. Hubbard appeared before our committee, uh, we asked him to give us a case where somebody was damaged by pharmaceuticals imported from Canada, for instance, and he couldn't right. give well, us Well, there are five, five deceased Canadians in Hamilton, Ontario from counterfeit drugs. So. There's five deceased Canadians? Yes, sir. From counterfeit drugs? Yes, sir. Norvask. Well, what does that have to do with the importation into the United States from pharmacists up there? Well, you said that uh, you know, bringing in drugs from Canada, which is a, a safe and secure drug supply system, which they do, well, if they're really counterfeit, shouldn't have been, a, been yeah, an event. No, 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 I understand. If there's counterfeit, regardless of where they come from, they can be contaminated and can kill people. But the problem is that people that were importing little old ladies and things like that, pharmaceutical products from Canada, they couldn't find any cases where there was any harm that had well, been done, know, although we'd well, you know, asked about that. In a lot of times when you're, when you're taking medicine like for, for cholesterol or high blood pressure medication, I think as an earlier panel has mentioned, it isn't a question of taking the drug and, and keeling over. It's a question of not getting the therapeutic benefit from the drugs that you're taking. I, I, I understand. <coughs> uh, how, how many people died from aspirin last year or Tylenol? Um, how many? Do you know how many? No, sir. Well, I, you, you, it was in the thousands. From what I've been told, and other medications like that. Uh, but anyhow, that, that's another issue. I, I guess the main question I had was, how do you police importation of pharmaceutical products? And I, I don't know. It, no matter how many laws we pass that deal with the problem here in the United States, as long as people can buy those products over the internet from outside the country, you still have a real policing problem. Oh, absolutely, no question about it. But I guess the point is not to exacerbate the problem by telling people that that, that they should do it. Because it also it allows people that are trying to take advantage of these people to, to make to to sell more bad product. Okay, well, I guess my last question would be then: Do you think that one of the inducements for people to go outside the country to buy these products is because things like tamoxifen costs four or five times as much as it does uh, here than as it does in Canada, and people who are dying from cancer want to be able to buy their product and they can't afford it, and so they say? in desperation, if I'm going to survive, I've got to get the product. I've got to split my pill. Sometimes you have people go to the pharmacy here in the United States and say, I have to split my pill. And so the reason they do it is because 
of economics. Sure. People in this country do that. People in Europe do it as well. It's, it's, it's a common practice. People want to get something less expensive, and, they, and they, especially something that they need you know, for, for their life. You know, it simply becomes a question of you know, what, are, what are the trade-offs. I mean, if, you, if you want to you know, have drugs, you need to have them, have them available. You know, if you want to get a drug cheaper and you want to go outside of the regulatory system that your government provides, then you, you take risks. Mr. Chairman, to your point, that it goes back to the whole issue of you know, what is the job of the FDA and, and to my former colleague at, the, at, at OCI, you know, how can they be better funded to make sure people can get the drugs that they need and that they're safe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Goodney. Uh, thank you. And uh, just for the record, then, uh, Mr. Kiefer, your company does do work with the pharmaceutical industry. And Mr. Pitts, your, your organization does receive significant funds from the pharmaceutical industry. I don't think I said, I don't know what significant means, but they definitely do receive funding, yes. I wish it was significant. Well, would you submit for us a record of how much money you got from pharmaceuticals last year? It's a, it's a 501c3, so those records are, are publicly available. Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Catazone, I, I just want to say that I agree with everything that you said. And I, I, I mean, I've been studying this issue now for five years. Uh, I often tell people I feel like the little boy who comes in and asks his mother a question. His mother is busy and she says, go ask your dad. And the little boy said, well, I didn't want to know that much about it. Uh, I sometimes feel that way. But I think you, you really hit the nail on the head. And, and my concern about whether it's this bill or, or this whole issue of counterfeiting, there are, there are different motives uh, by different groups. And uh, my real concern, and I, I do agree with you, that the, the pharmaceutical industry really doesn't want to solve this problem because the technology exists to, 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 in terms of solving, that's not really the right word. We can never solve any problem completely. I mean, we live in an imperfect world and, and there are always going to be people who will take advantage of it. But the truth of the matter is, neither the FDA nor the pharmaceutical industry has taken a particularly keen interest in solving this problem. And I believe, and I will just say this for the record, I believe the real reason is they know if they really solve this problem, all of a sudden, and somebody said the Internet has changed everything. And it is true. Because until the Internet, we didn't know how much more we paid for prescription drugs than people in Germany or Italy or France or Canada. I mean, in the information age, you can't keep those things secret anymore. And it has changed everything. And yet, in the information age, we still want to pretend that we can hire enough policemen. And, and, and with all due respect, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure you can hire enough enforcement people to ultimately change consumer behavior on this. And you are correct. Probably 10,000 packages arrived in Minnesota today, uh, and, and some of them through the, uh, the state-sponsored website so that people can buy their prescription drugs from Canada. Uh, but I would love to work with, with people who are really sincere about resolving this, because I think if you go to the RFID tags that, like these, or as I say, the latest technology, which are microscopic taggets, all of a sudden, you know, then it becomes a world market. And we can track this product wherever it is, wherever it comes from, where it was produced, when it was produced. But as, uh, Mr. Catazone, I think you're exactly right. I'm not sure the FDA or the pharmaceutical industry really wants to solve the problem because then it becomes a world market. And then they can't play the game where they sell some of these drugs for literally thousands of dollars more. And you mentioned, I, I don't know who it was that mentioned the, uh, the AIDS drugs. Uh, it, it's almost shameless what they sell some of those drugs for, especially when you consider that most of the research was paid for by the American taxpayers. But those are all policy questions that we have to resolve. And I, I want to thank you all for coming because I think this is a, it's been a very interesting hearing. And uh, Mr. Catazone, uh, I, I really do want to thank you because I think you nailed exactly what the problem is. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And I had uh, the other question I meant to ask uh, the, that I didn't get done because it's something that's kind of confused me all day long here, and that is, if we get the pedigree, we saw the, the question of, of the grayness, uh, the gray market and all that, but if we get a pedigree, does in fact, um, if the pedigree includes black marketers, that just enables us for law enforcement purposes to go back and figure out how it got bad, right? Does it, uh, does, uh, uh, does it put, is another advantage of this, it puts pressure on uh, individuals to f have a shorter pedigree uh, that uh, announcements like CVS did or we heard Walmart, bigger companies can figure out how to do this. They probably can short buy directly from the manufacturer. In fact, they can probably hammer the price down at the manufacturer level. Um, wh what is a practical impact of a pedigree 
to a uh, independent pharmacist in a small town who's buying wholesale? It, with a pedigree, you can track that product from the manufacturer throughout the distribution chain. And if you alert people to not accept any products where that pedigree doesn't exist, or the pedigree's been altered, or the pedigree's gone outside of that normal distribution, you've placed a major dent in the counterfeit drug so market. So first off, one would be the mere existence of a pedigree. Exactly. The second thing is, how would you know, uh, if you're a small pharmacist, what's outside the chain? Th that's what the normal distribution has been from the manufacturer directly to the pharmacy, or from the manufacturer through one wholesaler that's been authorized or that's been accredited to the pharmacy. Anything outside of that is outside of normal distribution. Okay, so what we're really looking for are very short pedigrees. Exactly. Yes, uh, and, and, and very uh, tight. It's not, otherwise it just looks like an analysis of figuring out after somebody's dead, you can go back and figure out how it got there. Yes, as sir. opposed to, I was trying to sort through the prevention side. Um, Mr. DeKiefer, in, in uh, fairness, you said you provided data to other companies as well. What other companies besides pharmaceuticals? Yes, <clears throat> we provide data to uh, footwear industries, to apparel, to food industries, to um, high-tech electronics, because the, uh, the same kinds of people who are diverting drugs are also involved in, in all kinds of other illicit uh, black market and gray market activities. So uh, we work with a number of clients in a number of different industries um, to try to identify leaks in the supply chain. And, and very often we find that uh, the, the bad guys don't divide their industry the same way that legitimate companies do, and they'll steal anything. So. Yes, we do have pharmaceutical clients. We also have clients that sell sunglasses. I thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you for your patience this long hearing. Thank you. That thank subcommittee you. stands adjourned. The Senate about to meet this morning to work on defense authorization. The bill would authorize $441 billion for the Defense Department operations for fiscal year 2006. Two hours of debate and amendments, and no votes are expected today. Live Senate coverage now, here on C-SPAN 2.